What's up, comrades? Welcome to this week's episode of Red Library, a political education podcast for today's left. It's here. The hour has finally arrived. It's part four of Red Library's Real Late Night Philosophy Hours. Who up? And we are finally tackling, after months and months of hinting, of intimating, Mari Rudy's The Singularity of Being, Lacan, and the Immortal Within. It's yours truly, Comrade Adams slash Chairman Bain, and the one, the only, Comrade Commissar of Degeneracy, Comrade Alex, here to take you through two whole separate parts of our in-depth and thorough read-through of Rudy's text. This is going to be our last episode of 2020, this nightmare of a year, and we're hoping we're going to go out with a bang, with something very relevant, and really a culmination of most of the work we've been doing across our show, across our appearance on The Regrettable Century, about psychoanalysis, and on the Lost Horizons Network over the last three or four months. So we could not think of a better text to pull all of these threads together into one final bang before we go on a much-needed month-long break. We also just wanted to say how truly humbled and full of gratitude we are for all the new support all the new listeners, all the new patrons over this year. Y'all have been amazing and really keep us motivated, inspired, and fired up to keep putting out the show week in and week out. It's been a lot of work, but you've made every little bit worth it, and we do this for y'all out there, comrades. One last time for 2020, let's run down the various ways you can continue to support Red Library or begin supporting Red Library if you aren't doing so already. First and foremost, if you'd like to become a patron, head over to www.patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Red Library Podcast. And for as little as $1 a month, that is less than a quarter an episode, you get access to all of our exclusive patron-only content, access to the Discord server, the possibility to appear on future episodes, to be part of our roundtable discussions, movie nights, and everything else that we're cooking up, all of our diabolical schemes, ship posting, wholesome discourse, all that stuff that happens in the Discord. That's the main hub. Remember to you like the show on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We're building a very small Twitter army of followers. I'm not sure how much that really means, but we're doing it anyway. If you're listening on iTunes, please go down, give us one of those star reviews, maybe write us a line or two as that helps more and more potential comrade listeners all over the globe find the show. Remember that Red Library is part of the Lost Horizons podcasting network, a collection of shows focused on developing the dialectical pessimist perspective that includes us, our podrads over at the Regrettable Century, and from 78. Remember, we have have a monthly roundtable discussion with a varying cast of characters from all the shows talking about all sorts of things related to politics, philosophy, psychoanalysis, and all that other good stuff. You can find a link for that in the show notes or just search on your favorite podcasting app. Well, here we are still, after all. All right, y'all, let's get into this thing. Again, this one's for you, comrade listeners all across the globe. It's been a long time coming. Mari Rudy steps into the Red Library. We'll see you back here at the very end of part two, dropping in just a couple of days. Enjoy. ready to turn these podcast machines on? I'm ready. Let's do it. Real late night philosophy hours. The first one in like fucking 20 years, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. It is absolutely the late night currently. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's late night somewhere. It's late night somewhere. And we're going to fucking hit the philosophy real goddamn hard. <laughs> it's late night in our souls. <laughs> <laughs> it's always. 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 Late night. Mwah. Mwah. I was thinking about it. This is actually like kind of part four in the series because we did Zizek's Lenin 2017. We did Badiou. Mm-hmm. On philosophy for militants, we did Dupontich, what is sex, and then this will be the fourth installment. So we're doing Mari Rudy's The Singularity of Being Lacan and the Immortal Within. So we're we're kind of yeah. like making our way apparently through all the like heavy hitters of mm-hmm. Lacanian post post psychoanalytic thought. Yes, post 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 post, post psychoanalytic <laughs> thought. Yes. T- today's podcast brought to you by Post Serial. Uh, <laughs> make sure that you <laughs> thanks Post. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I was almost thinking like Post Serial as in Serial the podcast. You know that kind of oh. Picked Yes. the whole podcast uh-huh. craze. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It's a multifaceted series. text right there. Damn, man. That's a deep cut. Yeah, deep cut. Deep cuts. Deep. <laughs> Thick cuts. Thick cuts. <laughs> You're on Real Late Night Philosophy Hour. So it's uh, it's uh, the OGs here. It's uh, Chairman Bain and, uh, well, I'm, I mean, how dare I try to introduce you and steal your thunder. It's just uh, Savage Randy. Uh <laughs> Commissar Degeneracy, uh, CC Alex, for those of you who don't know who I am. Yeah, um, a- if AKA you don't, Savage Randy. <laughs> yeah, AKA Savage Randy. Yeah, I, I don't know what you're doing if you don't know who I am at this point, but uh, 
It's well, okay. maybe this is their first episode. I'm actually wondering if this might bring in some new listeners because as far as I know, there is no podcast in our ballpark that has covered a text by Mari Rudy or Zupanchich. Well, actually, I guess Neil and, and a few other shows have done yeah. Zupanchich, but yeah. I think we might, we're capitalizing on the market. We're getting in on the ground floor with the Mari Rudy reading. Yeah, I'm glad we read this one because I think, you know, it's got a lot of really interesting, a lot of really interesting stuff in it. She's, she's kind of like working through a concept that I think has like a lot of emancipatory potential and yeah, she does it in a, a pretty interesting way, you know? I feel like she brings in a lot of other thinkers that we've covered in the past, mm-hmm. like Zubancha, yeah. Zizek, Badu, yeah. you know? So it's like a natural next step, I feel like. Yeah, I think uh, so, too. Also, I got to give some uh, shout-out recognition here. Do This was actually a suggestion from one of our patrons to do this book. I'm not going to mm. dots them, but you know who you are. And this was like eight months ago. Yeah, it's been a while. I think, I think you know, you suggested that we do this together quite a while back, and yeah. I was like, Hell, hell yeah, you know, and yep. then, <laughs> and here we are, uh, six months later. The podcasting world is at time. What is time? Abolish time? Uh, it's a flat right? circle, and we've yeah. abolished it. That's we've part of our it. platform. So, Well, I will yeah. say, we, we may forgive, but we never forget. We never. <laughs> never forget. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, this was a suggestion from one of our patrons. So, yeah, I think it just fits perfectly into the Real Late Night Philosophy Hour series, which is really kind of just like real late night philosophical psychoanalysis hours, because every book is also True. overlapped with some sort of like key psychoanalytic post psychoanalytic thinker i will say i think that that's just kind of like i mean not just to us but i think to like a lot of people on the left that's just like a subject of fascination right Mm -hmm. now i think that because you have so many thinkers that are like invoking psychoanalysis um both you know like with zizek to understand hegel and like like adrian johnston like trying to talk about neurology and like Like neuroscience yeah neuroscience um you know there's just like a lot of different perspectives that are being taken that are like involving psychoanalysis that it's just like a hot it's a hot topic uh (laughs) It's, it's come back around. <laughs> Thanks, Hot Topic, for sponsoring. <laughs> Thank, thanks for rejuvenating psychoanalysis for the left, giving us lava lamps, <laughs> giving me corn and Limp biscuit t-shirts when yeah. I was in high school. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, dude, my entire brain is just like colonized <laughs> by fucking brands. Like, you know, I, like the other day I was thinking to myself, man, I really got to get that done. And then in my brain, all I saw was just like a giant Nike check and it said like, just <laughs> do it. And I was like, no. <laughs> like, you know how many times I literally will say to myself, myself i'm loving it (laughs) i just say that to myself all the time now fuck (laughs) yeah yeah we're all fucked yeah everything is recuperated well i think you and i are also recording this episode i mean this is kind of auspicious for a couple of reasons one this is our last close out you know real straight banger that we're doing for 2020 Mm -hmm. perhaps the most nightmarish year i've ever experienced as long as most of the world It's been a real one. It's guys. been a real one, guys. A real one. So we're we're gonna close out with Mari Rudy for 2020, but this is also coming. What maybe a couple of weeks after we just went on the Regrettable Century, our partner show yeah, from the yeah. Lost Rising Network, and we talked about psychoanalysis and revolutionary politics. So this uh-huh. is also, I think, a good complement to that too. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll get into it. I think she like addresses it almost directly. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know. So yeah. definitely a lot of talk, lots to talk about here. We're gonna try and hit it hard and deep. <laughs> <laughs> the way we do. Here we go. And Here we go. Off, off to the races. Off to the races. <laughs> I will say, I'll, I'll preface this by saying, because I do, I do want to just, because this is going to sound like me just shitting on this book, and, and I don't mean it that way, but I was absolutely like big mad. You were very big mad. Book. Yeah. Um, reading it. it takes a lot of shots at Badu, shots at Zizek, shots at fucking everybody. Yeah, she's coming you for, your, for your boy. Yeah, Pretty yeah, for my boy. Yeah. You know, and, and others. And I think that at the end of the day, they were generally in agreement, mm-hmm. you know? There wasn't yeah. really a whole yeah, yeah, lot yeah. to the criticism other than like, you know, sort of vacillating like little minor discrepancies. Mm-hmm. And they had sure. there was a purpose to all of that. But I think, yeah, I spent a lot of the book big mad. And uh, you'll probably hear that <laughs> because a lot well, of my notes are like sort of infused with the yeah with the uh, Green Hulk energy. <laughs> Just kind of from from my perspective where I'm coming from, you know, I, I know I have definitely made very very strong statements about Mari Rudy's influence on my life and like my respect and admiration for her as a thinker and as a writer and and um you know a person who's developing this perspective so that being said I also have some pretty severe criticisms of Rudy, especially when we were talking about this before we started recording, around what the political implications, or I think the underlying political assumptions in the background of her interpretation and her particular way of approaching Lacanian and psychoanalytic concepts are. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be critiqued for sure. I think one of the things I want us to like delve into, maybe kind of in relation to our Regrettable Century appearance, is 
you know, what is the relationship between someone writing about psychoanalysis very much in terms of like the individual's experience of subjectivity and, you know, making like making sense of the world and, and how do you challenge like structures of power? What's the relationship between that very focused on the individual versus psychoanalysis as a like a sort of political framework? Because yes. I think that's where Rudy fails most dramatically. Yes, actually, it's interesting because you actually asked me this question earlier and mm -hmm. I was struggling to kind of like formulate an answer. And I think that you hit it like right on the goddamn head. Basically, there was a degree to which when I was reading Rudy's assessment of this idea of the singularity that she's kind of presenting throughout this work, that what I kind of felt like I was left with at the end was like, this sort of hyper individualized mm -hmm. particular way of addressing a subject that maybe functions in analysis because in yes. analysis yes. there's a degree to which you absolutely have to like hyper focus everything that you're doing but then that expansion yep. into the political implications of like that hyper individualized focus not only that but like a focus on kind of what seems to be to me maybe like a very first world Ooh, subject yeah. that is yeah, not yeah, yeah. really necessarily in the working class that kind of is struggling I mean like one of her major metaphors throughout the entire work was that Santner uh -huh. thing and, and the reason she brings that up is specifically to sort of like denounce the academics quote unquote yep. that are like sedimented in their ways of thinking and are sure. not really like leaving room for emancipation sure. so we'll talk about it but like <laughs> we're yeah, gonna get into it guys I was a little big mad because yeah it, it definitely felt like I mean I hate to kind of use this word but like a non-inclusive way of looking at the world there's like a very mm. specific kind of subject that she's centering this idea around that isn't necessarily the subject of the working class I would even are yeah. you or like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know yeah i think we should hash it out because even though i think prior to recording this we were like realizing like we might i think come down differently on the text i think at the end of the day where we come down very much at the exact same point on is the fact that like rudy i think is critiquing people like zizek and Badiou for not being as emancipatory and as universal as they claim to be uh -huh. and also rudy herself is also not as like universal or as emancipatory as she could be yeah and i think that's why you know and i was mentioning you and some of my writing, especially on those last two, uh, on these instrumental selves blog pieces about dialectical pessimism, you know, as much as I love Rudy, I was like the meme of the kid who like pulls out the gun, who's yeah, crying. He's crying. Well, gun. He's like pointing the gun and has to like take out like the person that he loves. It's like, I love Rudy. But also I was like, I think that Rudy's oh politics and the background of all this are so deeply like bourgeois and middle class. I think that her approach and her method and her conceptualization on the level of the individual, like if you were in analysis, I think is to me unparalleled. Mm -hmm. And I find it to be the most useful in my personal life. But as a set of politics, I actually find her to be, again, I think there's stuff to get, to take from her and push even harder, I think, in a way that captures something I think that we really sorely need to think about like revolutionary collective subjectivity or whatever. Yeah. But I just don't think she gets there. And I think part of why she doesn't get there is maybe because of a little bit of maybe your class background and the yeah. assumptions there and her position yeah. in the academy. Well, and, yeah, so. and working out of, yeah, absolutely like a college, university yeah, world she, yeah. of like that's where everything's coming from and that's where she like encounters all of her major criticisms yep. and like mm -hmm. all of the pushback yeah, yeah. on any of her work. So it, it makes sense, you know? So like, don't get us wrong. I mean, I feel like this is like the pitfall of just about every person writing of like course. philosophical texts of course. since what, like the enlightenment, yeah, you know? Like, <laughs> so, uh, two, three centuries perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like not an enormous criticism, but if it is reflected deeply in the like structural analysis of psychoanalysis that you're presenting, then like maybe it's, it's important to be talked about, you know? So I agree. And maybe kind of before we start diving in, the the thing I would kind of leave listeners with to think about as we kind of dig into this is that, you know, I think the idea is not to just like wholly reject it, but to like take it and like work through the ideas. But at the end yeah. of the day, it's kind of like all your psychoanalysis are belong to us. It's like, no, we're gonna, <laughs> we're very much interested in like tearing these things out of like the hands of just like gatekeepers and mm -hmm. like academics. And, you know, yeah. like I have friends who are academics, like they're, you know, they're fine. But in terms of like the structural <laughs> position and the role of academics in terms of theorizing something that's radical and emancipatory, you know, maybe it's just me being a real dumb guy materialist, but part of me still cleaves to the idea that like your position in the social order greatly affects the underlying ideological assumptions in which you interpret ideas and conceptualize oh, things. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, I think fucking let's hash it out, man. Let's do get it. Started? Let's do it. Engage brain folds. All right. <laughs> brain. Where do you want to start? Because I have notes for the introduction. I actually thought the whole first paragraph to me, whenever I read this, the thing that really got my attention very quickly, I'd read two Rudy books before this. I read The Call of Character and I read uh, Distillations, her book on affect theory, which I personally is my favorite book 
of hers. Okay. But one of the things I really loved about this is sort of the starting point of how she's going to conceptualize probably, I mean, I would dare say maybe the most enduring uh, conceptual legacy of Lacan, which is Lacan's three registers. What we typically talk yeah. about, and you've heard it on our show and other shows all the time, which is the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real, the capital R real. So I kind of wanted to just start by reading the first paragraph because I think her introduction of this to me was actually one of the most clear and concise ways I've ever heard anyone discuss it. This will be kind of our opening salvo, and then we'll, we'll kind of dive into it. So she sure. says, from a Lacanian viewpoint, human subjectivity entails a constant negotiation of the three principal registers of being the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real. The symbolic interpolates us into the normative regulations of the social order. The imaginary founds our conception of ourselves as individuals who possess unique personalities and the potential for exceptional existential trajectories. And the real intrudes into our lives as an unruly vortex of bodily jouissance, jouissance and unintelligibility <laughs> that disturbs the reassuring yet ever fragile coherence of our symbolic and imaginary configurations alike. The fact that this trinity coincides loosely with the Freudian distinction between the superego, the ego, and the id is not a coincidence, nor is the fact that Lacan focused on the tensions and antagonisms between these three components of being. In his early work, Lacan tended to privilege the symbolic over the imaginary and the real, linking the quote-unquote truth of the subject's desire to the signifier and banishing jouissance to the realm of quote-unquote impossibility. In his latter seminars, in contrast, it is the real, the kernel of ontological impossibility that never, nevertheless causes tangible psychic effects that take center stage. So I think that one thing we need to be really clear about with Rudy's framework here is that she has really staked her claim on an interpretation of Lacan, or, you know, Lacan changes, right, over the course of yeah. God knows how many years and how many seminars. But I think Rudy's, like, whole emphasis is on a very particular point. I would say, like, earlier, like, in Lacan's seminars, I think it's between, I can't remember what exact seminar, I think it's between, like, five and eight, but her idea of das Ding, or the thing. Mm, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of her interpretation of a lot of this stuff, and maybe we could even say why she focuses on it in the way that she does, I think is really drawing on her particular emphasis on what das Ding is, for Lacan. Now, you know, McGowan has said that he thinks that Dostain might have been Lacan's most radical idea that even Lacan pulled back from. And a lot of her work is very focused on trying to make Lacanian psychoanalytic concepts like very approachable to like general audiences. And in a lot of her other writings on love, on character, on individuality, on things like her book on like penis envy and stuff like that and bad feelings, a lot of it does tend to center on this idea of das Ding. So I think we need to also say that like she is very much staking her claim in a very particular point in Lacan's thinking. And I think that will probably shape a lot of her interpretations of this stuff. I was trying to find, I, I believe that she talks about it in Crisis of Consciousness, which is actually in the first chapter, but we can get there where she kind of talks about her idea of das Ding, like very specifically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. To echo what you're saying about that first, that first paragraph, absolutely a super concise way of like talking about those three registers, because yep. I feel like it gives a lot of people trouble. Oh, it does I, I, all I'm the not, time. You know, I'm not, maybe because I was introduced to like Lacan through specifically explanations of these three different registers that I'd kind of eventually just forgot that that was a thing that people struggle with. But like reading that is like actually like a really, really good, just like encompassing of yeah. like the three registers. And I think that that's really helpful sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and linking it back to Freud, you know, because I think that's, that's also really yeah. key. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to the fucking language that is used in psychoanalytic discussion can sometimes just be like in itself a mm -hmm. whole fucking task yeah i feel like it's know? it's a it's a whole like dialect you have to learn it to then be able to read things and understand yeah. and understand like what's being said and what the debates are mm -hmm. I, yeah. I will say just one thing i want to tag on that i thought she did a really good job of so basically what she connects this up to is that the symbolic for her is really the location of subjectivity yeah. The imaginary is the location of like personality, personality like her individual yeah. ego and personality. And the real is going to be her location of what she's going to call singularity. And that's going to be the whole focus of the book. Yeah. So maybe uh, let's talk about the idea of singularity, right? So let's like, do what, it. What is it? Um, I think singularity. What is it all about? Yeah. <laughs> what is the singularity? It, um, <laughs> Is it whack? <laughs> is what, it whack? What's the Ali G thing where he's like talking to Noam Chomsky or like the computer scientist and he was like, oh he was God, like, science, what is it all about? Is it cool or is it whack? Or is it whack? <laughs> science, what is it all about? Technology, what is that all about? Is it good? 
or is it whack? So that's really yes. how I want to approach this through an Ali G framework. Well, okay. So like, just let's just define it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> the Ali G uh, definition of the day is <laughs> singularity. So for for Murray Rudy, basically, what singularity is, I think at its most basic, is it's a way that a subject is responding to trauma. Oof, um, yeah. And Big oof. Yeah. Yeah. So she she kind of like and nicely, everyone is traumatized. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're not <laughs> not a subject of trauma, right? Yeah. Like no one is exempt. No one is safe. <laughs> We are all <laughs> we are all like bastard children of, of the fucking traumas of our life. So so I like the way that she actually describes it. This is actually getting into chapter one already, but yeah, well, we can, I don't know if you, we'll, we'll you were ready like, for yeah. that, but we'll, I, I don't really we'll have a lot of notes on the intro. Um, I have a good amount actually. Okay, well yeah. I mean, yeah, feel free to fucking keep talking about that, but I just just to no, define do your thing this. and then I think I'll uh, there's something I want to link it back to that's probably gonna be related, so go for it. Okay. I like the way that she calls a singularity a tapestry of pain. <laughs> Okay, uh, and, and that's it was just beautiful that's when I read why that. I, I was like, like Mari wow. Rudy so much. <laughs> I was like, that's that's gorgeous because I think that like uh, a lot of times this idea of singularity or the way that it is conceived of traditionally in psychoanalysis is that it just is sort of the terminations of all of your like symbolic or like all yes, of your signifiers exactly. and how they sort of terminate beyond yep. beyond the horizon of what you can understand consciously. Yeah, and that's kind of what we call the unconscious. It's just like this empty void space where like things fall into, but we can't get get them back. Yeah, it's almost you know? like. It's it's almost defined by just being like, well, it isn't able to be symbolized. Right. And that's just kind of it. Right. And so I like the way that in a sense, she's kind of trying to sort of pull some of that back from out of the depths of the unconscious and give it like this character of like, look, there is a structure to this thing because we can't symbolize. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have like some kind of effective means of like accessing it. I mean, yep. how could psychoanalysis be functional if we didn't have mm -hmm. a way of accessing these ideas or like, you know, these sort of unbeknownst to you known things by you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so like so the unknown knowns, the unknown knowns of your psyche. Right. Yeah. Basically, she, she kind of talks about it. As like saying that the, the subject doesn't just happen upon she she also links this to a compulsion to repeat. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. And so she she kind of says that, like, there is this compulsion to repeat that we all experience as people. At the end of the day, she she's kind of trying to say these are not just like dumb autonomous repetitions that we just like can't make sense of right but rather that there's like imprint or like a trace of the traumas that we've experienced that in a sense create the thing around which we find ourselves repeating ourselves she kind of says when we're trying to work through our incoherent signifiers right like we we are sort of getting at what this thing called the singularity might be right it's mm -hmm. sort of like the space that is created around your failures to keep in mind what it is that you're trying to signify throughout your existence yeah. right yeah. and mm -hmm. like you know she she's saying it, it's kind of a way of coping with trauma and 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 so doing she's sort of kind of trying to you know it's almost like you know we're exploring mars or something right and it's like by being the first one to get there you just like put your flag down and mm -hmm. i kind of feel like there's a way in which She's kind of trying to put her flag down in that space, even though there's nothing really to put a flag down in. Yeah. It's sort of like similarly to um, I would even say like in our Zupanchich episode, right? Like talking about how sex has that character of being like unsymbolizable, not because it doesn't exist or because it's like some kind of amorphous, chaotic realm, but rather because the way that it was informed in your mind and in your symbolic mind comes from somebody else's un like only half formed version mm -hmm. of a of a of a signifier and yeah. so it's kind of like that impossibility is just like passed from one subject to another and one subject to another yeah. and then eventually you end up with this idea that's like fully functional in your symbolic order but has no like point of termination or point of origination right it just mm -hmm. like and i mean in a lot of ways most of our signifiers are like this but there are some that have like a particular kind of influence right because the things they implicate us in are like they they carry much more potential for trauma you don't necessarily need to know why they call it a mcrib right but like <laughs> you're not, i'm sorry i'm gonna keep doing this um but like anyways <laughs> but um so yeah maybe i don't know maybe you have more to add to like what the the idea of singularity really means for for rudy yeah actually there were a couple of things that i found really helpful so she basically says that you know whenever we talk about like personality and, and the realm of, let's say, the imaginary, 
Um, I thought it was really helpful that she said personality stipulates the kind of person one is, but singularity speaks to the specificity of one's unconscious and drives, mm-hmm. fundamental fantasy and repetition compulsions as as like what she calls a life orientation. Yeah. And that essentially for her, like singularity is that which cannot be subsumed under any taxonomy, hierarchy, classification, any type of the social order is that which always escapes the symbolic and hence the social order. <clears throat> it's just kind of, kind of like she's trying to describe a certain kind of gravity of like, yes. of like your life and in the yeah. physics, like a physics type of sense right that like there is matter in your world right because gravity is curving space and matter just like sort of accumulates in the Mm -hmm. places where gravity has been curved around or or like space has been curved around so like in a sense she's kind of trying to talk about that force which curves the space in your Mm -hmm. reality that you encounter as like material uh or like matter right that like the the substance of your life is really sort of being created by a certain curvature of the yep. space that you can't really access directly, but is absolutely having an influence on your life all the time. Well, it's exactly like it's what lies beyond the event horizon of what you can actually consciously fucking yeah no or like symbolize <laughs> right like you don't want to go beyond the event horizon, bro. Trust me. I don't know, man. Have <laughs> weird you, shit happened. Have over you there. seen High Life? Because I'm pretty sure. Well, actually, speaking of which, Event Horizon is what I was talking about. It's the movie Event Horizon. Oh, oh shit! I was actually thinking of like I just watched Interstellar again the other day, but also oh. the movie High Life with Robert. Pattinson there's this you oh, know yeah, this like life. yeah but oh, all, but I also Event Horizon the horror film which I think is just like I mean, one of my favorite bonkers. horror films yeah, of all yeah. time that's a great one uh, we've actually referenced that whenever the where we're going we won't need eyes to see yeah we won't need <laughs> eyes to see and he's just like fucking <laughs> Sam Neill <laughs> like, is just like fucking legendary in that film oh shit but you know there's this interesting way that a lot of like films that I think as they've tried to portray the implications of quantum mechanics and things like black holes and singularities and you know being able to like you know travel through wormholes and stuff it like what they always come up against is what would happen beyond the event horizon Mm. so interstellar portrays it as like oh that's where love of like a father and his daughter is right but high life is easily the much more radical film because past the event horizon and high life is literally incest it's the incest taboo (laughs) oh yeah so big wreck for high life please watch high life i think it's one of the best sci-fi films i've seen in years yeah yeah very 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 good movie yeah and and i think that that's a great way of putting it right like beyond the event horizon of like of like what we have access to right like what does happen when you like just fly right into the goddamn black hole you know yeah Yeah, just nonsense chaos right but in a sense we don't have to fly into the black hole to know that it is causing us to stay in orbit around something Mm -hmm. yeah right and um i think that in a lot of ways life is just like a certain kind of like astronomy right like we're having to like like navigate how we're gonna land on the planet and like how we're gonna you know well that's just i'm being a nerd right now i mean there was real nerd hour shit man so you and i both have a strong penchant for science Hell yeah. you know so i will say one other thing that i think is really key here as a definition or like an element of singularity for her in the real which i think is very easy to miss if you interpret this kind of stuff in like this weird like uh like existentialist kind of way that the unconscious and like singularity is not some inner essence that is non-alienated so it isn't like oh we need to gain access to the unconscious so we can find like the real self like the authentic self well and we'll come back to that because Mm -hmm. i do think that toward the end of the book she has some Strange moments where that mm-hmm. that authenticity yeah. sort of like comes back through, and I'm just you know it's like one of those words that like anytime you hear it you gotta like load your gun or whatever yeah you know, yeah like, yeah and like I some Heideggerian bullshit that's coming at you right <laughs> yeah, there. yeah yeah you don't wanna don't don't be a fascist kids if you ever hear <laughs> being somebody an existentialist talking, is being a fascist <laughs> <laughs> well well yeah, there's you know, an like, argument to be made and uh, case closed <laughs> um, no, we're not gonna I, explain that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think of myself as an existentialist in a lot of ways, yeah. but maybe in a more of like a like Robert Solomon or yeah. like, you know, I, I arrive at it. Oh, through, yeah, R.I.P. R.I.P. Yeah, Zaddy he Solomon. Was yeah. He was a yeah, king. He was a king. Um, but like, you know, I think that I arrive at that through a lot of interpretations that maybe aren't necessarily conventional. I, uh, I think it's a lot more about like responsibility and things as opposed to like the Nietzschean variant where like I think people fall into like a certain kind of nihilism or a certain kind of just like dread, you know. Are 20 years old and wear a fedora. <laughs> sure. So. <laughs> All right, but let me let me finish my thought before sure, we get yes, too please. too too out into out into the weeds. So, but what I think what Mari is going to try to do, and I think you're right, she tries to square the circle or like thread the needle, and I think she sometimes is more successful than others here. It's a tension in her work, I think. The singularity is not some non alienated like inner essence, but it's a non symbolizable surplus, a stain in the symbolic order and the horizon of cultural intelligibility. So I think that's really key mm-hmm. to distinguish between those. Like it isn't some 
thing that you could get access to. And if you just got access to it, it would mean that you're able to like find your quote unquote true self. Right. It's, it's something different than that. It's this like, yeah, weird kind of like excess monstrous surplus that kind of is always there, like staining the sort of perfect functioning of the social order as it exists. The other thing I wanted to say too, though, and it was one of the things I actually appreciated most about Rudy's work in this book is her distinguishing two different kinds of trauma. So we were kind of joking about how uh, like yeah. everyone is traumatized, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. no one escapes that. Mm -hmm. And I think that what is really easy to miss, and I will say, I think that a lot of people I know who are Lacanians do not distinguish between these. And I think it actually causes them to be very easily misread is that there is what Rudy calls the constitutive trauma, which is basically just being a, so a subject that's like basically traumatically pulled into the social order from like your very earliest experiences. Yeah. So there's that kind of trauma, but then there's also what you call circumstantial or structural and historic trauma, which would be things around like oppression of like women and like people of color and like indigenous peoples and like, you know, like yeah. colonialism and imperialism. So I think, I don't know if you've seen this, but a lot of times I've actually seen people like critique psychoanalysis for not like for talking about trauma as if like these are the same things and honestly I think a lot of Lacanians don't really have a good answer for it because right. they don't know how to distinguish between the two right in in the clinical practice of psychoanalysis I think that in a lot of ways there's a there's like a he there has to be a heavy focus on constitutive trauma right and yeah. I think that there's a tendency maybe <laughs> to like reduce people's engagement with those like historical traumas as just sort of like ways of fantasizing or ways of like trying to tame your relation to your own constitutive trauma. Absolutely. And then Absolutely. it just kind of gets like left on the wayside. And I think that in, in a lot of ways, that is something that psychoanalysis needs to engage with more more than they are now. I think I think it's really, really easy to just be like, ah, you're just fantasizing. You're just caught up in the in the image, kind of like we were talking about with the mm -hmm. revolutionary oh, yeah. uh, Lacan episode Absolutely. and just be like, oh, well, you're fantasizing about your potential or like who you might be right. and stuff is actually just causing you to think that these things are important to you when in reality, you just need to change something about your immediacy and then mm -hmm. you're going to be fine. Or it's and, like, oh, yeah, just focus on the constitutive trauma and not the circumstantial as yeah, if like it's an like, either tell me more about your father you know so, yeah. you know and so like or the idea that you know that basically to focus on the circumstantial trauma is to like get lost in like just like id poll or yeah like the the image which i just think is like a horrible misreading and usually says more about the limitations of the person saying that than like actually what psychoanalysis could do and what yeah. it has to say yeah yeah and uh i think that differentiating between those two traumas is pretty important and i think that toward the end maybe some of the like more consistent criticisms that i may have i mean like just branching mm -hmm. off of what we already said earlier is that that emphasis that we end up sort of teasing out of Rudy as like maybe one of the major criticisms we have on the subject, the emphasis on the subject, or mm -hmm. like, you know, what she might call the singular is in a lot of ways, some kind of hyper individualized echoing of mm -hmm. like, maybe like a capitalist subject. Yeah. Um, yeah you yeah. know, and, and, and so like, at the end of the day, maybe this isn't even really a problem in the, in, in, Rudy's thought, but rather it's just something that's endemic to psychoanalysis. Because that's, that's a good question. We yeah. encounter this a lot, right? That's like, true. This is part of the reason why we felt we needed to do an episode on the emancipatory potential of Lacanianism or just like, you know, Freudian thought even as well. And so. Exactly. Well, right. let me let me tag a few more uh, things just about our starting point of the singularity and, and the three registers, and then we maybe can dig into chapter one. How's that sound? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. So discourse, quote unquote, the discourse, the discourse. Uh, subsumes us in to history and overruns us with social totality. So Rudy also says that the singularity, why it's the place of maybe some something much more emancipatory, it destabilizes us at the level of the body and the drive energies of the real and gives rise not to a harmony of the social order in our relation to it, but what she calls existential bewilderment. And that this arises from the social subjectivity being disrupted by the distortions of the drive energies, which can never be depleted or incorporated fully, which I think is really key here, right? It's like the symbolic can never fully capture our drives and like it always creates this excess, this stain that always mm -hmm. like haunts it and disrupts it. One of the things I do like about Rudy though, and I think she does this in this book and also in the book Distillations, is that... I think she does have daggers out for kind of everybody, which is oh, one yeah. of the things I do like about her. So she yeah, goes like after it. phenomenology, the Frankfurt School, post-structuralism, you know, certain readings of Lacan. But she also has some like pretty sharp daggers for deconstructive feminist theory and queer theory as well. And mm -hmm. one of the things I like that we're going to talk about is, you know, she critiques Zizek 
about his idea that like destitution is like the the ethical point. Yeah. But she also goes after Lee Edelman and his mm-hmm. book on queer theory and and Death Drive, which I think is also a really interesting criticism that she has. Yeah, like I think when I was reading that, I was a little like, hey, don't go after you know, like I was like, don't go after <laughs> queer theory. I like what that guy's saying. Yeah, yeah. You know, but there, I, I understand. It's like I understand where she's coming from because yeah, just she's developing this idea of the singularity and its importance to you know, uh, a certain way that the subject can like regain access to those things that may in a different world be just viewed as like some kind of symbolic oppressive, yes, absolutely. you know, notion that they don't have any ability to control or conceive of. Yeah. And I think maybe that's a good kind of transition point into chapter one, which is, I think that's really Rudy's whole sort of claim. And what she's going to try to argue in this book is that this failure to link the subjective destitution in like people like Lee Edelman or like Zizek or whoever to singularity actually like obscures the way that we do always have the ability to like sort of shape and change the symbolic order. And, you know, maybe the thing we'll talk about it, the potentially like kind of more liberal political implications really come down to her basically saying, so we have kind of two choices. We can fundamentally reject the social order sort of writ large as the side of like emancipatory politics, like the side of destitution, or, you know, we can also recognize that we're, we have this ability to shape and reshape it because of our embeddedness into it from the place of singularity and the fact that there's always the stain, right? It never right. fully colonizes us, which I think is one of the things that we were talking about on that Red Desert episode too. Yeah. And that may be one of the things that can be interpreted from this book as like, yeah, like you say, kind mm-hmm. of having that liberal ethics of yeah. like piecemeal change is, is still good change mm-hmm. you know and uh the, like radical emancipatory or maybe revolutionary context for change isn't necessarily what we always need to do and mm-hmm. or you know isn't always appropriate or something like that um so yeah i wanted to get into it by by looking at what she's talking about with regard to this like idea of repetition and like sort of how it appears in our subjective lives and also kind of like the difference between drive and desire, kind of like Ooh, what yeah, you're hinting at there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so in uh, the section repetition as destiny, which is already in the in the first chapter, mm-hmm. she, she makes this metaphor of how repetition kind of ends up being like a fixed set of rails that only have the capacity to take us to certain places, despite our best intentions yep. to mm-hmm. end up uh, somewhere else, right? Um, and she's sort of bringing this up because she's kind of talking about how, in a sense, our way of conceiving of our own lives takes on a certain character of being comfortable to us. And so when that repetition and that like structural component, that gravity of our lives doesn't repeat the same types of things over and over again, that we have this way of conceiving of that as like hostile to our understanding or our comfort with our own lives. And and so she's kind of trying to like highlight this distinction between what we find to be offensive in our own experience and what might actually be <laughs> offensive to our own experience. So like in a sense, that repetition or that set of rails that we're used to being on that kind of continues to take us to like places we don't really intend to go is actually the site of comfort and actually the site that our endeavors hope to preserve. And so she's kind of trying to highlight the distinction there, right? Just because we have failures in our lives doesn't mean that our complaining or our hyper focus on our failures is necessarily us recognizing the things in our life we want to change. In fact, she's kind of, this is just a general psychoanalytic notion, but in a sense that complaining and our recognition of our failure to arrive at where we intended to arrive is actually just us trying to preserve specifically the way that we fail over and over again because yep. it's what we find comfort in. Mm-hmm. And and so there's that. Um, and she sort of like links this to the ideas of drive and desire, which in a sense drive is sort of this way that we materially sort of move towards what we what we think. And like kind of like that lost object dusting that we mm-hmm. were talking about, yeah. right? And like it's it's a way that we orient ourselves towards that and, and try to endeavor to reach it or, or regain it back into our lives, even though it's not necessarily a thing that can be regained. And how that process of trying to move towards that thing that has been lost by us you know quote unquote also generates this excess of like what we might call desire right Mm -hmm. which kind of has a different it just has like a completely different structure in relation to that which we're seeking it's never the thing that will be satisfied by us reaching what we what we want it's just something that sort of peripherally renames our signifiers yeah and that we use to try to recapture that lost thing um yeah you know and so which i think is really important as a different interpretation of desire and drive in let's say someone like mcgowan in our capitalism and desire reading series because mm-hmm. i think for mcgowan if you only focus on desire 
you know, what are you left with but this idea that, well, like, everything you always pursue is never going to, like, satisfy you at all, and it's always structured in this way that's fundamentally a fantasy and blah, and blah, yeah. blah, blah. And blah, and, and, and so on and so on. And so on and so on. <laughs> um, but but, so, but, but yeah. I want to say that that's, that's the fundamental conception that he had, McGowan has about the capitalist subject, right. right, is that. Yeah. Basically, this endless pursuit of new and new objects that are going to, like, keep on coming out and keep on, like, making the promise that they're going to satisfy something in your life, and you keep chasing them, and you keep chasing them and you keep on moving to the next that's the subject of desire that's um you being motivated by something beyond what you can materially attain Mm -hmm. um and so it's like you being motivated by that excess that's created by the lost object yeah right as opposed to something like drive right whereas drive can actually get you closer to the thing that you want but like also has its own consequences i don't know i guess i need to like maybe like put this in a different way it's kind of like the way that she describes it is that the drive is the more proximate counterpart of desire that like your subjective motivations through drive actually come closer to the lost object. Yes, absolutely. And that drive is when we go after an object of desire and desire is our sense of wanting to be reunited with the lost thing. So there's like a there's like a difference, right? Desire is anything that makes us hear the echoes of the lost object as opposed to drive, which is something that is us actively like pursuing the object itself or what we have ascertained the object to be. Absolutely. Right? And I think that that's one of the reasons why I always say that to me, like Mari Rudy helps me understand like my own personal experience of things like love and, you know, things like pursuing like shit, like doing this podcast, Yeah, you know, things in like the realm of revolutionary politics, because I've actually found her interpretation of Drive and Das Ding to be actually much more in alignment with what I actually experienced, which is this idea that like, yes, there is this way that like us as capitalist subjects, there are all these things that we're struggling in a way to desire in this like commodity form the way that McGowan talks about but I think the thing that Rudy provides is that well because capitalism also is this like huge symbolic social order <laughs> there are always things that are staining it that are these excesses upon it that do give us what she would call like a sense of like partial satisfaction. They're like these partial objects that yes, they're, they might be rare, Mm -hmm. but when you encounter them, it's very clear that they're activating something very different. It's, it's like, it is the drive that you're encountering. And to me, that's why I always have, I've gravitated towards her more than anyone else, because whenever I think about, yeah, just like on an individual personal level, like I have had experiences like that whenever it's very clear that there's a different structure or logic that's operating. And to me, like, she, her approach to like Das Ding and its relationship to drive versus like V desire in the way that McGowan talks about the capitalist subject has actually been like a much more useful way to think about that than like anything else I've encountered. Yeah. I mean, just to, before, because I feel like she's about to get into Das Ding here in just a mm-hmm. second. So before we do that, I just want to like yeah, yeah, emphasize. So she also calls out this idea um, because a lot of translations of Freud translate drive or treat as like instinct. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's like, that's just like a big, like, <laughs> like you fucking fail. You did it cor- incorrectly. <laughs> and I understand that like, maybe that's a word that, that in German translates to the English for instinct, but she's basically emphasizing that this is like a complete misconception, not only because it's just like a mistranslation, but because drive specifically often works against our bodily needs in pursuit of the lost object yeah. so that in a sense kind of like what i was saying before about like that railway that we're used to being on that leads us to the wrong place all the time is something that we hope to preserve like this is kind of what she's getting at that like what freud calls drive is absolutely not like a natural instinct it, instead it's something more like our tendency to work against our own what you might call instincts right like our own yeah. pursuit of the the material things that would just make us like satisfied in life is not the thing that we're referencing when we say drive, right? Your creature comforts like having shelter and having food and like whatever warmth from another human being or something and whatever, like those things are not what we're talking about. We're talking about the way that we pursue the things that absolutely take us away from those creature comforts or in in a sense threaten that homeostasis of like our existence as material beings. I think talking about this as a way to think about homeostasis of us as like these embodied subjects is so crucial here. I think this is why people like Adrian Johnson and like Antonio Damasio's work are so relevant to talk Mm -hmm. about because a lot of times what we're getting at is the way that yeah the very sort of structure of like drive or desire whatever it is like actually is a thing that's disrupting us on this level of the body and homeostasis i want to tag something on really quick that's important before we get into das ding she has this great way of conceptualizing this where she says the psychoanalytic subject embraces the substance of our symptoms 
over the nothingness of their absence. And it gives yep. substance to the subject's jouissance. So that's what the symptom does, which I think is so crucial. Mm-hmm. So it becomes more manageable. Repetition is reliable as an effective defense against unrestrained jouissance and that it's both a trap and a defense. So it's like something that we're defending ourselves against this unmitigated like jouissance, but it also traps us into the structure of the symptom as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, I think she also, and maybe just like a final word on this this idea of drive. It's something that she makes a big point of that although the drive is this thing that we're encountering that sort of goes against our you know homeostasis, kind of like we're saying, and is not to be confused with instinct. She says that part of the importance of highlighting this distinction, right, is to note how the drive is also situated in like a socio-historical context. Mm -hmm. That it's not like an essence, like you were saying before. It's not like the beyond of the symbolic that like, you know, exists in the real somewhere in this authentic way that we can be reunited with. It's not that. Uh, But by not being that, it makes it to where the subject is not determinate to the drive. Yes. Right. Exactly. And and in a sense has the capacity to move beyond their desire and move beyond this like toxic relationship to the things that they're motivated toward and that these things can change. It sort of opens up the space for our like socio historical context, right? This cultural thing that we're engaged with to shift and to become something different. Absolutely. Um the maybe a problem, you know, this is to foretelling what's to come, right? But like maybe the problem is we don't really have a link yet between the way that this plague of drives or, or desires affects the subject and how we can sort of universalize this idea into something that's larger and actually has a culture cultural subject totally agree as with opposed that. to like an individualized subject so yeah i think that's like one of the limitations of this and the way that psychoanalysis is conceptualizing this at the moment or at least the way that we were encountering it is that there isn't a clear link between what the implications of this are for the individual to some sort of like radical i i keep saying this word collective emancipatory yeah. project or subject yeah that's what we're trying to get at that's I mean, what we're I here think, to do you yeah know, that's what our marxism needs <laughs> well yeah exactly uh, so in in uh crisis of consciousness which is in the first chapter Rudy starts talking about like kind of what we've been discussing here, right? That the desire, basically she establishes this, which I think once again, it's like another like deep psychoanalytic principle that prohibition is what engenders desire or prohibition is what breeds desire. Not being able or like being kept at a distance from that thing which we believe we are kept at a distance from, I guess, is what creates desire in us. And desire acts to keep us at a distance in relation to the object of desire. But close enough to still fantasize about it. Don't be fooled, right? Like desire, unlike drive, desire is something that aims at actually presenting an obstacle with which we will become implicated as opposed to presenting us with with the real lost thing, you know, that we will become implicated implicated with so yeah don't confuse your desires for what you actually want because god knows that's not that's not the thing you should do that Uh, that (laughs) might be the main underlying symptom or like a fundamental disruption within the subject for all of psychoanalysis is like the way that we confuse what we desire for what we actually want Mm -hmm. yeah and so so then she kind of begins to talk about fantasy and what what fantasy is in psychoanalysis as well something that makes our relation to the other such that we never get too close and encounter our jouissance right and so that's like a lot of fucking big words i don't know uh (laughs) if you guys are following that but i was actually still just thinking about the uh the object of desire is being like withheld from you so you can desire it i was actually just thinking about the mcrib over and over again (laughs) (laughs) which in a way is kind of a really uh, ingenious use of the structure of desire. <laughs> I think I think this is my interpretation of the McRib, right? Like <laughs> we we are seeking the uh, the rib that we lost uh, when when God created <laughs> Eve. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to like reencounter our, our manliness That's by like a spicy literally right there. eating like a like a, <laughs> a pasted together piece of meat that looks like a rib rack. Yeah, like composite. Know? That's yeah. really doesn't even have any bone in it. There's it's no just bone in the shape at all. Of a bone. They literally deny us the bone. Holy shit. Uh, anyway, uh, that literally, I just thought that up like just that now. Was, I've never thought about McRibs this deep. That was Please low key me. brilliant. That was low <laughs> key brilliant. Please believe Please me. Please believe me. So, uh, do you do you have anything else you want to say? I was going to read a couple of I things. I feel like you're. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Because, like, actually, I feel like we were going to. We were about to talk about. 
that's ding and i mm-hmm. started talking about fantasy so go yeah just say yeah so rudy basically says the desire protects us from dreesance and the drives but every desire also contains a seed of the drive in every desire so i think it is mm. important here to talk about that for lacan you know the object petit a, like the object a is yeah. not necessarily the thing that we desire it's the it's the object cause of desire it's the thing that sort of starts the circulation of desire like it's like the obstacle that creates the structure of desire in the first place yes um and that good objects are those objects of love and this is what rudy is saying but the object of the drive is the object of which the drive turns and so this for her is what she calls dusting or the thing it's basically this like quote unquote lost object which mm-hmm. just to be really clear about this it isn't an actual object that you lost. Right. It's kind of the way that in Zupanchich we talked about, you know, there's always one signifier that fell out. Mm-hmm. It isn't something that has this like substantial material presence. It's similar to the way for me, I was thinking about this over the weekend about how, you know, in Freud, Freud basically said that anxiety is this like core experience that we have and really related to the feeling of anxiety is the feeling of guilt. And he was Mm -hmm. like, now you may never consciously understand that or like think that I am guilty of X, Y, or Z. It's something that you almost kind of read in the structure of how anxiety functions, that it's, it's like you're unconsciously operating as if you were guilty. And so I think that to me, that's a really helpful way to think about the object cause of desire. It's like your whole way of functioning and your whole subjectivity is structured around an object as if you lost this initial object. Yeah. But again, it isn't like you could point to some material substantial thing and say that's the thing that you lost. And so that's related back to what Rudy says is like we have to be aware that like there isn't some non-alienated core of the subject. It's like a stain that like persists through the structures that we're like consciously engaging with and interacting with yeah and and another thing to note about that is like that that thing is also it's impossible to like truly have a relation to it where you where it doesn't enrapture you right like there's and this is what we always because we say this quote all the fucking time about like lacan and he says like the only thing that you can be guilty of is like giving way with regard to your desire right and and in a sense this is like exactly that like what you just mentioned right like the cause of anxiety is specifically the way that you believe too strongly that your compromise in the direction of the thing that you desire is something that that you've compromised on, right? It's almost like your your belief in it is what structures your anxiety, not because because of its falsity, right? But because of the way that its fiction presents you with something that you can relate to. And this is also the concept of like, uh, I think in Hegel, like Zizek talks about Gegenstoss and he kind of oh, like yeah, relates it back. Because we talked yeah. about this in the, in the Red Desert episode. Mm-hmm. I don't know yep. if that's out. I think it's out. Yeah, right? it's, yeah, it's out. It's the, the idea that the loss itself precedes the things that, that it sort of divides by its loss or that like the things that the difference precedes the things that is the difference between. So in a sense, it is the moment of loss that retroactively creates the object that you seek after in your desire. And in a sense, it couldn't have ever existed in the way that you conceive of it when you pursue it. So yeah, let me, this is actually a a quote from Rudy that I thought was a good encapsulation of this. And to me, I I mean, I I love her writing and and this is a good example of it. So this is her talking about uh, Dostang. She says, yet it's fantasized loss engenders a whole host of important psychic effects, bringing into existence the Lacanian subject of lack, a subject who is forever plagued by the sense of having been robbed of something unfathomably precious. To be specific, it is because the subject cannot have the thing, Dostang, that it feels compelled to reach for its echo through the various objects of desire, the objects ah, that it encounters in the world. It is because the subject cannot have the sublime object that it is driven to look for its luster in more mundane substitutes. And she says that there's a distinction between desires being barred versus those that aim at the sublime object and gain their fullness by being in proximity to the drive. So, or that they have like this aura of the drive. So that's kind of the, I think what you were saying really well earlier is like the distinction here. There are objects that are desired by us because they're prohibited. And Rudy is saying, And there are also these other objects that do seem to capture this sort of sublime, like closer proximity to the drive. And that's the distinction that she's wanting to make, I think. Yes. And I think that this is a good time to mention also, because she has like a really beautiful way of describing, I I think it's in the section that she calls the crisis of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting idea. She's kind of talking about how there is this internal distinction created within the subject because of the relation of all of these things, right? Like the signifier, which is like the thing that we identify with that we're kind of talking about. About creates these like drive circulations or these desire relationships and the way that that 
signifier creates a certain constancy of like us being thwarted from like the thing that we're actually chasing. And so she describes the idea of consciousness being sort of a crisis in this way that like what we experience as the stability of our like side of consciousness is actually like and the way that we're like inter like intertwined with reality is actually like this really really precarious relationship almost Mm -hmm. like a spinning top that's always like threatening to like tumble over kind of and like it's a really nice description because in a sense it like situates us really in that position of anxiety that i Mm -hmm. feel like we we apprehend a lot where like your relationship to things can be so so fickle right like you feel one day like you're completely like dedicated and motivated towards some goal and then the next Day, you're like ready to give up on life because like some minuscule thing happened and, and sort of like thwarted your ability to relate to that that goal that you had before and and I just think it's like such a such a truth of like yeah the human experience that like what we rely on and the stability of our our subjectivity or like our internal understanding of ourselves is like forever kamikazing itself into the <laughs> void of like you know it's, just it's, like it's, impossibility of like sustaining like a yeah like a steady rhythm yeah and it's, it's like, forky it's for- <laughs> yeah it's forky <laughs> i am trash yeah i am trash yeah. Uh, trash no 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 that's the trash these are your friends Come on. Hi. Ah! <gasps> trash so Absolutely. yeah, I think that she basically says the death and negativity of the death driver what make us human, not any like positive quality. Yeah. And she says that it installs an alterity of non relationality, and that really at the core of what it is to be human is a dense core of existential loneliness. Yeah, here's a quote from her uh, from that section: Despite the protection offered by social structures and the fixations of desire, we have no choice but to live in a constant dread of imminent disequilibrium. Hell yeah! This is why the drive is an important an ontological notion changing our conception of the parameters of human life. Yeah, and I think that for Rudy, I just recently heard her say in another book that really at the end of the day, her concerns and her whole project is really asking these questions about like, what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. And I think this is like why she's driven to approach psychoanalysis in this way. She is trying to understand these questions of, yeah, like fundamental ontology of the human subject. Oh yeah, so she also says that jouissance connects us to a type of infinity that exists as negativity. It Mm. exists as a stain on the universe. It precludes self-closure and yet makes us reach for the transcendent, which is that idea that it's like it is vivid very yeah. failure itself that creates the structure in which like we can reach for like you know something that could be dusting or the sort of transcendent capacity and i will say i think this is an interesting thing that i think even maybe she sort of like pulls back from is the emancipatory potential of that you know mm-hmm. like what does it mean to reach for the transcendent past the individual subject and i and i think that to me i think you could push her ideas in terms of like the political implications much further than she tends to do in her books at least yeah but i think this is exactly kind of the point right it's that idea of like by understanding us as this sort of negativity in this kind of way it is the thing that creates the possibility of yeah like transcendence in the first place right and i I almost want to like create this is maybe stupid and mundane but like i just had this idea of like imagining this concept that she's describing as like sort of like an outboard motor on like a boat Mm. where like what you're normally keeping in focus is like what's in front of you in the direction that the boat is going so that you can end up at the destination that you're trying to end up at but what you actually have control over is like this motor on the back of the boat that's like propelling you in a certain direction so you actually have to think in this like strange way of like how do i aim this thing that's like in negative and and reciprocal or whatever yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. like completely like, backwards to the yeah, direction yeah, yeah. that i'm actually trying to go so that i can like orient myself of course it's not as easy as just like moving the outboard motor in real life like you don't even know it's what horribly the fuck it, painful yeah it's horribly painful and not only that but you have absolutely no ability to see where you're going yeah, anyway exactly. so yeah, yeah. but <laughs> but like i'm just thinking it's almost like there's this weird reciprocal structure that we're like engaged in all of the time which makes it really really difficult for us to find direction in our lives which may sound like self-helpy but like in a sense like understanding this relation that we have to our desires and to the sort of like negativity of the real really is something that helps motivate us and also like you said is, is like the part of us that's constantly dipped into the potential for for difference for, for yeah. actual emancipation exactly. yeah in, in this weird negative direction it's almost like i feel like zizek says this at some point where it's like what we don't need to change is like the future we don't need to like reconceptualize the future but rather we need to like completely change the past retroactively so that we can like understand the real direction that we need to move this from is this point forward this is why my number one influence on my whole thinking and like way of being in the world is 
like Walter Benjamin. Because oh, yeah. Walter, mm -hmm. like Walter Benjamin called it, we all need to take a tiger's leap into the past. And it really is about our relationship to the past and this complete radical reconceptualization of our whole relationship to it that is the real place of emancipation. I want to add one note, and then I'm going to ask you about Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. okay. So, uh, for Sorry, my brain just did like a backflip. I'm trying, like, I just thought of Jordan <laughs> Peterson in this context. It was just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so for Rudy, intimations of immortality, since the book is called The Immortal Within, right? Hmm. So she's saying that for in uh, intimations of immortality, infinity, and the eternal arise from the split within the social order itself, not things that are transcendent of it. And it creates an other, quote unquote, other at the heart of the self in the symbolic order. So the I think the implications here for her is that there is this sort of like imminent transcendence that is possible, not as some like out there like heaven, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that one's a little bit for Comrade Samuel out there. Mm. But it is the very fact of like how do we reconceptualize our whole relationship to the social order and the symbolic and the self in a way that makes us, creates a gap or a fissure in which to recognize the transcendent as this like material concrete thing that we're like in relationship to if we just like reconceptualize our relationship to it. Now, right. I will say, let me bring up why I wanted to mention Jordan Peterson. So I think that Rudy, like, can very easily get this reputation for being, like, I want to do, like, self-help Lacan. <laughs> but I have to tell you, like, I think that one of the things that we really miss an opportunity to do is to really grapple with how seriously to be engaged in left politics and talking about trauma and the social order and oppression. We have to have some way to actually speak to that in a way that could be incorporated into a larger like revolutionary leftist project. Now, I think that, you know, one of the things that typically gets talked about with like Peterson, right, is like, oh, like Peterson speaks to the experience of like usually hyper conservative reactionary young men <laughs> in a way that like gives them an answer for something that they are experiencing as like a real alienation or a real sort of crisis of like the symbolic order, like mm -hmm. the social, right? Yeah, like it, he, he recontextualizes their inability to like engage with their emotional feelings. Yes. Uh, in a way that is cerebral and continues the same narrative. Exactly. <laughs> Like, exactly. You know, like I cannot engage with those things. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. It kind of preserves the structure, but also addresses the, the thing at the heart of what what makes people sad. Exactly. And that they can't deal with. Yeah. So I guess like my thing is like reading Rudy. And this is, I think, part of why I actually really like the idea that she's doing like kind of more self-help stuff, but like from this Lacanian perspective, because if we're going to talk about what does it mean to be, if there was to be some sort of parallel or analog for some sort of radical emancipatory politics, I actually think that she has a lot to say for how to conceptualize all this kind of like these like crises of the social order mm -hmm. in a way that actually is much more open and amenable to a revolutionary politics. I don't think that she like does it herself all the way because it's still very much trapped in maybe the individualistic assumptions of class position or maybe like the clinic or psychoanalysis in general. Yeah. But I do think I read this and I'm like, man, this is like, I think answering a lot of the same questions that someone like Peterson is trying to answer and doing it in like a real dumb guy reactionary way with his dragons and his union archetypes. But I, I'm just like curious what you think about that. Cause I, I read this and you know, I have to tell you like one of the reasons why I like Rudy as much as I do is because this is like really personal shit for me. You know, like there's things that she has to say about trauma and our relation to the symbolic that to me have helped make sense of like really core experiences of alienation and trauma and pain, you know, my tapestry of suffering mm -hmm. in a way that I, found to be like really helpful actually to engage in leftist politics in the way that I do. I mean, I'm not sure if there's like a super coherent question in all of this, but just the idea that like calling it self-help isn't necessarily a bad thing to me. It's kind of like yeah, we no. might need something like that. No, yeah. And I think that like, I mean, at its heart, come on guys, like we can't really lie to ourselves here. Like what is psychoanalysis, but like an extreme, <laughs> like a uh, taxonomy of self-help, right? Like it's, it's like a way of That's engaging. Spicy with... <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not trying to piss anybody off. I know I will, but like we should be trying to piss people off yeah yeah you know but like at the end of the day what what are we really doing in psychoanalysis but trying to help people right like I, and right? specifically through the avenue of the self right and, right. and like hell you know for like Give me you my know anarchist snaps for that right like what it's worth right in this sort of particular historical era of like the absolute like siege on the self right like that this idea of what selfhood is and like how it exists in our reality is like constantly under siege by just about every fucking 
domain that we're expected to engage with. I mean, in in every way, right? So, well, I think about you know that Rick Roderick, yeah, Rick series, Roderick like series? Self Under oh, yeah. Siege. I mean, yeah. there's a reason why he named it that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, they have big ups to fucking Rick Roderick. Yeah, I mean, Jesus, R.I.P. Man, King. like that yeah. guy was. Yeah, like changed my whole fucking world. You and me both. Uh, like Rick Roderick is still probably one of the most influential philosophers on my life. Period. Yeah, that guy knew how to fucking talk about philosophy. You know, and I I really appreciated that. That was the dimension that I encountered him, you know, it's mm-hmm. like through those speeches oh, or yeah. like through those like the talks. great courses. Yeah. The great courses. I was yeah. like, dude, this is amazing. But so anyway, I wanted to kind of come to this idea. Like, so, uh, it, Rudy talks about, for, she's kind of making this distinction, right. In the undeadness of drives, which is like the next section of this chapter. Mm-hmm. She, she, Comes back to this idea of personality because she kind of mentioned the idea of personality in the intro. Yeah, it's um, like in the in, in the to realm the of the image. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, she kind of is trying to dis- distinguish or differentiate between her idea of the singularity of being and like what we might call personality because it sounds a lot alike, right? Yeah, the this like compulsion to repeat that's unique to you that comes from your tapestry of like pain and that like at the end of the day it it like sort of like makes you a subject that's unique unto you and can't really be universalized to other subjects necessarily. But then it's like, I think people's conventional understanding of a domain like that would be the the domain of personality, mm-hmm. right? And so she's and kind the of the domain being like, of self help. Of self help, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and like and ego like psychology, Enneagram, and, blah, blah, blah. and like all these like ridiculous, like, you know. Uh, did you ever you know, do the Enneagram? I never did Enneagram. The one that I always did was the other one, the the where you end up like with four letters. Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs, yeah, yeah, that's the one. And so like you know, we always had this. I think it was like mostly dating websites that pushed this bullshit. Oh yeah, you know, like do a fucking personality test and it'll tell you exactly who you are and who you're compatible with, so you don't have to think about the implications of love and like your connection to another <laughs> human being at all. And like you know? the deeply traumatic experience of love as an event. You know? Right. Like all you need is an image to cast out, and like we'll give you the image. Don't worry. Ooh. Um. And yeah. so. <laughs> Here is your image. Choose yes. from any of these commodities. Yes. Are you a hero? Are you an anti-hero? Are you are you a sad boy? Are you um, <laughs> are you an e girl? <laughs> big titty goth girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Are but, you a doomer? Are you a bloomer? Are you a broken bloomer? A broken bloomer? <laughs> yeah. That one that was just for CC Alex right there. Jesus, bro. Like yeah. when I read that meme, I just like the broken bloomer. What what was it called? Yeah, it was called like, the the broken bloomer. Yeah. yeah. I think it hit both Ouch. of us a little too hard. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> So she basically rails against this idea. She says that the two ideas are conceptually linked, but they're definitely not the same. She she mentions how drive, any drive, is ultimately participating in the death drive. And I think this is an important concept to bring up, right? That there's yep. like a degree to which like everything that we're experiencing in the in the realm of drive is something that like moves us it's almost like trying to reunite us with death you know <laughs> kind of hell like yeah this, right <laughs> like it's like big sad energy but so she kind of says that the singularity is sort of like a conglomeration of all the things that are morbid or unacceptable about the constitution of one's desires and personhood and it's not anything that we would conventionally present as our personality in fact that like drive sort of march on despite any potential breaks within their own functioning and in circumstances that the subject may experience to the point of being so persistent to be called like undead or like garish and that's like the name of that whole section is called the undeadness of drives um and she's kind of saying that at the innermost core of our subjective being there is this precarious spinning towards death that is at once both a constant motor pushing us through life but also an empty shell hiding no pearls so like in a sense there's like nothing in inside of us but but like this like furious spinning mm-hmm. towards death <laughs> yeah. kind of that that we experience Fucking heavy um, metal i love it yeah but she's saying that that although it's inaccessible to us it is our only i said the in in access to the real it's our only access to the real but specifically in the form of being Im- impossible to yeah. access mm-hmm. and so yeah i i just i like <laughs> i like all of these all of these images and i will take them you know but like <laughs> i <laughs> i just think that yeah at, at the heart of things she's really trying to create that distinction between what we might call our personality these like positive characteristics of like Absolutely. how we relate to yeah. each other and to the world it's like no 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 it's getting at the heart of like of like what motivates those relations like yeah sure at the end of the day when you sort of like take account of how you exist in the world it takes on a certain character and maybe a myers briggs or like an enneagram type of test would have some things to say it's the same way that like your astrological sign might have some things to say about how you relate to the world right but like internal to that is like this 
impossible mad spinning of like this other thing that's that's sort of functioning underneath the surface right that like none of those tests or or like attributions right. really get at and understanding that is the realm of psychoanalysis you yeah know? well i think that maybe two big implications of everything that she's doing in this book and her whole framing of how she interprets these correlatanian concepts i think come down to two key things one i would say what are the implications for the subject as like an ethical being? Like, what does it mean to be ethical or what is the mm. place of rebellion and ethics from this way of conceptualizing Lacanian psychoanalysis? And I would say the other one I think is, is it possible to change fate? Which I think is a really like going back to that train metaphor, what we're getting at, what you were talking about with the outboard motor, I think is really like in uh, kind of the stakes of this. We're, we're really mm -hmm. trying to understand how does one change your relationship to what feels like one's fate? That's why she talks about Aristotle at the very beginning yep. is like Aristotle's conception. So before we kind of move on, because to me, I thought this was actually uh, this sets up the other chapters that we're going to get into mm -hmm. and her critiques of people like Zizek and Badiou and, and Edelman and stuff. Yeah. So she says for the nature of what is the location or act of rebellion in sort of Lacanian theory, she says that there are basically three conceptualizations in post-Lacanian theory. So one, we have an act from the subjective destitution, which causes a leap into the jouissance of the real, regardless of the consequences. And so she's mm -hmm. going to say this is kind of Zizek and yeah. Edelman's position. Yeah, yeah. So second, we have life-affirming conceptualizations of the truth event, capital E event, as an innovative rupture in the facade of the social establishment. So that's going to be, yeah, a big old bad you. And then... <laughs> Three is going to be a subjective singularity that surfaces at those quote unquote miraculous moments when the subject manages manages to push aside the edifice of its socio symbolic investments so as to release the drive energies that have become uh, congealed in such investments. So this is going to be uh, Eric Santner's Santner, idea yeah. and yeah. her. I feel like she kind she's of very much that, that is that, that is where she comes down. And yeah. so I think that like to me it's helpful to be like well regardless of which one of these you come down on. These are like three distinct positions that lead to ethical implications, I think, political implications about, you know, how you interpret these concepts. I yeah. was going to yeah, yeah. just make a make a quote real quick. So she uh, at the beginning of the stain of infinity is on page 23. I know we're not like yeah. getting too, no, no, too no, no, far, for <laughs> uh, but like she says, uh, our constitutive undeadness prevents the seamlessness of social assimilation, making it impossible for us to ever entirely fit in. So this is just kind of like branching off of what I was saying about those sort of like personality tests and how we can never really be in that position. I mean, like, God, wouldn't it be great if you could just take a personality test and that fully encompassed your position socially? Like, uh, but isn't there always the persistence of like the way that you don't really fit that mm -hmm. even yeah. as much as you can see it yeah. playing out in your life, you're not really encompassed by that. She kind of makes this argument that because the thing is infinitely denied to us, we in turn make a grasp at the infinite that is in our desire, right? And so she says there's a way in which our undeadness of drives makes us non-coincidental with the finitude of the material world that we're in. So we're not just like, we don't just fit in like little building blocks in the yep. material of the world, but yep. rather we're sort of always outside of it or always already outside of it. And she says it's specifically that non-coincidence with the like dumb inertia of the world that gives us access to the infinite. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually her kind of quoting Zupanchich and like expanding on Zupanchich yeah. all throughout that section. But it's a very powerful argument because it's basically, yeah, like saying, like, like you said, that it is specifically the way that we don't fit into the world and that we always find ourselves at odds with like our position subjectively. That gives us the ability to conceive of the infinite and like have access to it in yep. general. So it, it's important that we recognize this idea of singularity yeah. as being the site of, of that. And I know? think that like really what she's getting at here is to conceptualize of singularity in a way that allows us to weave like the real and jouissance into our daily experiences of the symbolic and the imaginary, which is, I think, again, what creates at least a possibility of this like fissure, which, you know, in the everyday, like the transcendent and the imminent become coextensive. Maybe this is where I've begun to to become big mad. Uh, <laughs> well, because we're going to get into her critique of Zizek and Edelman, right? Yeah, and and her in, invocation of this like centenarian language for talking yeah. about uh, the, the subject the and like the miracle yeah. and like the daemon and all the shit. The first thing she starts to talk about here in this chapter that I think I sort of took issue with was she kind of mentions creativity and sex. Mm -hmm. uh, as like examples of like the things in our world that give us access to the infinite. And she says sex, 
But her example that she kind of like leans on throughout the section is not sex. It's creativity. Mm. And I mean, I'm not necessarily in disagreement with her about those things giving us access to the infinite. I think in a lot of ways they do. But it sort of made my eyes roll. I think that and maybe this is just revelatory of like my position, like sex is almost like a nihilistic act, right? Like Mm. it's uh, very much in the in the realm of trying to divorce oneself from one's subjective experience, even just for like a tiny moment, right? Like moments of like orgasmic enjoyment which in a sense you could say are similar similarly to creativity right like when you're really lost in a creative burst you are not experiencing your life as like oh like immersed in the life world of like stupid mundane banalities but rather motivated by something that gives you sort of like it like reaches out a hand from the beyond and sort of pulls you in the direction of like the unknown and all of a sudden all of your concerns with your your mundane existence fall away same thing with sex I feel like you know, in that moment of like ecstatic enjoyment, what you're really getting is like like a momentary death from like the concerns of like your everyday life and your your experience as like implicated in reality. You just have like a small momentary like it's kind of like, yeah, like like your death drive, but like become manifest in like an act. Mm-hmm. Right. And so to me, her recontextualizing this like these moments, like creativity and sex as like a sort of access to the infinite just made me kind of like roll my eyes a little not not because I don't agree with what she's saying but because I feel like there's a certain camp that would interpret this as like some kind of like sex as like good for your health kind of interpretation that like creativity and sex are like domains of like positive motivation and like happiness and then you end up with like a bunch of people just trying to fuck everybody you know (laughs) or like a bunch of people just like being creative arbitrarily like just like writing all their thoughts down in a notebook and like conceiving of that as a real engagement with creativity as opposed to like the actual joyous impulse that like a spark of genuine creativity can create there's like a distinction between arbitrarily being creative as like a practice in your day-to-day experience and like i think the sort of joyous implication with creativity that can motivate you into the like sort of into the beyond Mm -hmm. of emancipatory engagement you know and i think that there's like a distinction there that needs to be made the same way there's a distinction between like different types of trauma right so do you think that like in, in that criticism, is it more of like how easily Rudy could be interpreted in that yes, way? Yes, absolutely. I yeah. don't think that Rudy herself is intending this to be interpreted as like institute more just like yeah, sex yeah, yeah. and comfort with sex in your yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. And like, I don't, I don't even think that that's necessarily a bad idea. I just think that there are certain camps that would read this and immediately be oh, taken sure. by this kind of yeah. like ethics of like we should just like engage with creativity and sex. And this is the way that we can like emancipate ourselves from the subjective It'd be like, position of pain. I mean, it would you know? fit right into like the new age bullshit, like bourgeois, like hyper neo Victorian subject. Right. <laughs> yes, like, absolutely. I mean, I think that is, I think one of the risks that she takes, like writing in this way that is designed to be more accessible is that, I think it is so contra to like our typical ways of relating to things like this that are about like, let's talk about like your day to day life and like who you are and what does it mean to be a human, right? Yeah. That I think it would be very easy to just completely obscure how for her, the negativity, the disruptive stain is precisely the thing that happens in creativity. Because I will tell you, I mean, you know, former like musician dedicated like half of my life to playing music like writing and everything else whenever you're in genuine moments of creativity like i would define them as being quite traumatic and very much driven by like a negativity like the jouissance like pulsing like i can't capture it it. (laughs) yeah and but also like will drive you to like pure acts of like you know bodily destitution and everything else it's like I would I just agree. imagine like Bob Dylan like falling off the stage. Like I, I feel like I, <laughs> yeah, I had a friend recount to me that experience of like seeing Bob Dylan in recent times, mm-hmm. like on stage performing, and he was so, uh, like drunk, I guess, on stage that he like literally fell out of his stool and had to yeah. be like carried off of the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like towards the end for him, but like, you know, it kind of makes me think of that, like that sort of that bodily destitution that you're talking about. There's like a certain aspect of the creative experience that although it gives you access to the infinite, it gives you access to the infinite, which yeah. means that you're going to like fucking do anything that you can to yeah. like get to touch that any, yeah. any, any time that you can, you know? And so I think that that can also have like extremely dark implications I, as opposed to being can. emancipatory. Yeah. So I just want to read yeah, kind of what's it. in my notes here. I, basically what I said, this is my notes on like in, intimations of immortality. I said, sex is related to a nihilistic impulse to divorce oneself from the circulations of the drives 
and the nightmarish state of managing one's being in favor of a momentary forgetting of that responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of what I was saying before. And I, I kind of made this, I, I just have this note that like, look, in case you were thinking of falling into the idea that like just engaging with more sex and trying to like harvest a creative impulse in your own life as like a daily practice or something is like a healthy habit. Just think of the way that sex already implicitly materially gives us access to the infinite through procreation, right? And think about conceiving the consequence of sex as procreation being access to the infinite and what that, what camp that would put you in if that's what you thought the way that sex gave you access to the infinite like if you were thinking of sex as being like a thing that's done for procreation and that's like a material way of accessing the infinite but then it's kind of like we've talked about this in other episodes like sort of anti-natalist like ethics and like sort of our consideration of the way that procreating for the sake of procreating is not access to the infinite unless you want this like terrifying nightmarish infinite of just like repetition of the same mm -hmm. right and so Anyway, that was like my that was my my criticism, basically that a, a much more direct line of thought there so that you don't confuse what Rudy is saying with yeah. something like that. Is yeah, that yeah, like yeah. that argument, which I feel like might you might find in like Jordan Peterson or something. Right. Well, that I think like, that's kind of exactly why I brought naturalistic up. impulses. Yes. And this is what really motivates us in biology is that like we just exist to have sex and procreate. Well, what are you really thinking? If that's what your perspective yeah. on the world is, is that emancipation? But if you think about it, right, like that's the like sort of the sort of fine distinction that has to be made is like it is so easy to interpret that stuff as being there is a transcendent like out there that exists above like the mundane right and i think that that's exactly what is so easy to miss if you just insert this perspective into like the standard landscape of like self-help bullshit right that just reinforces the capitalist subject is you would miss the idea that like no it's like what is transcendent and the singularity is not out there immortality is not out there it's it's coextensive is what i was looking for earlier with mm -hmm. with what is happening right now you know right. and i think that that's what gives it that disruptive negativity that people like jordan peterson never can capture that because they are real they're just too real dumb guy mm -hmm. to understand the distinction between the two perspectives. Right. And so, yeah, again, for Jordan Peterson or someone who ends up supporting that, like you just basically reinforce the social order as it exists and the hierarchies and this idea of, you know, there is a God out there that is this thing that exists separate from us that is immortal and transcendent. Like that's the real radical like difference. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, it still preserves this idea of like, there is earth down here and heaven up there. Right. And I guess the reason this made me so big mad, because once again, I don't think that I disagree with Rudy here, but I have to keep addressing this. We looked this up the other day because we were, we're planning on doing an episode about Jordan Peterson's new book. Yeah. Once again, it's, this is like a, <laughs> thing of my nightmares guys like seriously like like conceiving of reading 400 pages of jordan peterson for that episode you just like i just want to like already tear my eyeballs out of my face to be fair but, like, we said we're gonna listen to the audio, do the audio book book. At 2x speed. i still think that like tearing my ears out is like a, <laughs> like a real like ice picking my ears oh yeah um, that's, that's probably what's gonna happen instead. But, <laughs> but so anyway his books I, I feel like when we looked this up they were like number one or number two on like the global or like the mm -hmm. national bestsellers yep. list. Mm -hmm. So like, what the fuck? And then like, you know, Jordan, Joe Rogan's like podcast is like one of the top watch oh, things yeah. on YouTube. And yeah. like, you know, you just end up with these like really strange. It's like, why are people gravitating towards this shit? And then, you know, you have this argument being made in Zupanch's book. Now, don't get me wrong. I recognize that it's not the same people probably engaging with Jordan Peterson as are with Zupanchich, but I think, or Zupanchich, which, uh, oh, shit, that was a weird. Um, <laughs> that was a little with, bit of a uh, paraphrasis right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, I think that her decision in these instances, like in these couple of sections right here, mm -hmm. to sort of use this particular type of language about like transcendental experience and sort of kind of taking a soft approach. It's almost as though like she found herself in a position to like teach a sex ed class and rather than like make kids recognize that what the typical thing is that they do in sex ed is they make you scared. Like mm -hmm. you're going to get diseases. It's really dangerous because you could get pregnant. Like all of it is like bad and it should be avoided. I mean, at least, you know, here where we live, it's just like abstinence only yeah. sex ed. And Real she progressive kinda, shit here. <laughs> yeah. Like she found herself with the opportunity to like teach a sex ed class, but not be like doom and gloom about it. And so she ended up kind of flowering up the idea of sex and, and what it actually can of as opposed to being like yeah this is like some kind of dark manifestation of death death drive and like you know your your explicit engagement with like your drive towards your desires or like these fantasy like worlds that you exist in she kind of talked about it as like a transcendental experience and she relates it to the beauty of the world and she kind of it's the same way that in the first chapter like at the beginning of the chapter she kind of talks about 
singularity as being like the the tapestry of pain Mm -hmm. that you carry with you or whatever that sort of is the background of your experience i kind of feel like by using this sort of opportunistic like non-determinative language she leaves the door open for that kind of subjective interpretation that a lot of these like sort of popular understandings of sex like through jordan peterson or like through you know whatever like joe rogan's podcast although i don't know he addresses it directly (laughs) um can't remember the last time i heard (laughs) rogan talk about sex talk about sex and its relation to the subject uh, yeah um but like like, you know, I feel Could like you imagine if Rogan had Mari Rudy on for an episode, we should dude, try to make that happen. Uh, we should do it. We he, should just like it. flood his fucking he inbox because his whole like thing Interview is just Mari like, Rudy. Yeah, he'll just invite anyone on. Just be like, hey, how about a how about a Lincoln Zupancic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Every Red Library listener across the globe, please start flooding Rogan's inbox. For him to interview the Mari Rudy or Lincoln <laughs> Do it, guys. Be our army. <laughs> it's like, be is not your personal yeah, army. <laughs> yeah, we are activating all you Manchurian candidates, all Do you senior it. agents. Do it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, basically, my, my general criticism, right, like, in this section was just, like, who is Mari Rudy defending the subject from? And I think that it's an interesting question because I kind of started to get the sense that there is some character that is, like, haunting her idea of the subject and... She's addressing all of her criticisms of the way that we conceive of like what she would call singularity to to someone, to a certain version of criticism. And I think maybe she expands on that throughout the book, which, yeah, I know that she expands on it. Yeah, Adam's looking at me with this I'm like, just smiling. happy I'm smile. Just smiling. Um, but like in a sense, I kind of started to wonder at this point in the reading of like what like. Who is it that is attacking your concept of subjectivity that you feel like you need to use this like non-determinative sort of like relation to like this transcendental ethics and like just kind of, and yeah, it, it just made me feel like, wait, wait, who who is this an argument for? Like, I don't disagree, but like, I'm also like, sure. why are you putting the emphasis there and not in other places? Okay. So I think we should also, we're like at an hour and a half, so we should move into chapter Shit, two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah let's so it's go. all right. I mean, I know we're going to do two, but <laughs> There's like, a lot. I mean, I yeah. think that like a huge core of this, I figured was going to be us like kind of getting through these first like couple of chapters. Mm-hmm. But I will say that I think that whenever I would ask myself, like, who is this book for? Who is the audience of this book for? One of the reasons why I just like, I don't think I react as strongly to the possibility that this would be interpreted in this like positivistic kind of way that you're discussing. Mm -hmm. Because whenever I ask myself, like, who is this book for? It's like, well, she's obviously responding to the dominant perspectives on what Lacanian subjectivity is at the time she's writing, which I think are Zizek and Badiou. Yeah. And so I think that like, to me, I don't read her as like having this, like not like opportunistic, like non-determinant language per se. I read her as actually, I think providing a really useful and helpful critique against people like Zizek and Badiou's conceptualizations and like some of their limitations in a way that I actually think is really helpful to give you a better sense of different possibilities or expanding your idea of what a radical emancipatory subject could be. And like, I would never expect someone who would read Jordan Peterson or read like positive self-help shit to read this book. And maybe that's actually kind of a limitation in her approach, right? It's like, despite all her desire for this to be accessible to more general audiences, it's still people who read all that shit who are going to be reading this. Like, yeah. Like, like me and you, for example. Right, right. right. And, and yeah, I think that that was, yeah, that was my criticism in a sense was pretty much just like, it almost felt like Rudy was just trying to like pull psychoanalysis back in the direction of like, just like practical self-help. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I know that that's not what she's doing, but I feel like her emphasis throughout the book in disagreeing with Zizek, disagreeing with Badu, mm-hmm. even disagreeing with Santner in lots of ways and like yeah. other, other like realms of thought or feminism and stuff were in a lot of ways kind of trying to like yank back the potential of psychoanalysis from the clutches of like this like emancipatory destitution kind of idea i think that would, i would i would like agree with that your everyday experience and like the way that you are still free yeah. as like a subject in your current incarnation well and if you think about it too right it's like in a lot of ways i think what she's trying to unify or like synthesize in a way which again i think is like a very difficult thing to do and maybe she isn't always successful is i think a much more let's call it like like feminist project about like the role mm-hmm. of like the everyday experience and these ways that like rebellion and like disruption happen in terms of like everyday existence within social structures and oppressive hierarchies like let's say patriarchy right yeah with this place of like subjective destitution for someone like Zizek or Badiou I mean despite like you know their 
flame and i think they are like right engaging with like much more like feminist critique or like post-colonial critique or whatever like don't always i think really capture the nuances of some of those critiques which i think rudy is very very well grounded in so i think that you know whether she's always successful or not, I I think is like probably a different question. But what I think she is trying to do is say like, listen, there is this other perspective or there are, there are these other ways to engage with like what emancipation means and what subjectivity means like in this Lacanian framework using these other perspectives. And to me, I, I find that like whenever she can pull it off, I find her to be actually like almost like more relevant to me in my day to day life. I just also think like it's kind of fraught with with uh, risk and, and potential for, yeah. fa- for failure, which I don't think she always nails it. I think there are some weaknesses in her attempt to do this. I just really love the idea that she's trying to do it. You know, to me, it's a yeah. very useful project. Yeah. OK, so like in order to close the first chapter, because <laughs> I think, you know, here we are an hour and a half in and we're still in chapter one of like eight or nine. Just to close the first chapter, I want to talk about her her invoking of Santner, uh, some of her criticisms of, of like Zizek and kind of this strange line that she takes at the end of this. And I don't say strange strange because I think it's once again, like, you know, I think it's just right along the lines of what we've been saying the entire time, but she kind of makes this argument. And this is something that I had a criticism of from the beginning when she was talking about those rails that were mm-hmm. kind of stuck in uh, those sort of like train track rails. Yeah. Like every time I say rails or like train tracks, all I can think of is the stupid, like pull the lever to kill like four people. <laughs> the, versus trolley the, yeah, the trolley problem. <laughs> anyway, um, she's talking about when she was talking about that, I was imagining like, okay, but there's a degree to which like when we're following those rails there are instances that we do end up where we're supposed to go right she kind of describes that that metaphor of the train tracks as being this strange happening where like we are following the train tracks that are supposed to take us to like new york city or something i think she uses in her example but we always end up in the wrong place in boston or in like some other midwestern town Mm -hmm. or something and that we never arrive where we're supposed to and i during that time i even wrote it in my notes of like well, what about the times when you do end up where you're supposed to and you just have this like experience of just like, holy shit, what the fuck? You know, like this worked. And I think that that's absolutely a thing that happens despite your sort of like unconscious motivations towards your desires and shit. Like occasionally you do end up where you're trying to end up and it's, you know, maybe miraculous mm. in a sense. Right. But like she actually addresses that here. She kind of brings up this centenarian idea of like uh, and she does it in a strange context. She's basically kind of invoking the way that like the sort of gatekeepers in academia have a way of sedimenting ideas or allowing ideas to sediment that Mm -hmm. they just sort of become these like concrete growths on on academia that we can't really shake free and that they sort of get in the way of people like Mari Rudy just trying to help people she kind of like it kind of invokes this like look when you encounter the academics that are telling you that your ideas and your interpretations are wrong you just need to like believe in the miracle that can happen which is your like sort of ethical engagement with your ideas and your belief in the truth of like the direction that you are arguing as like its own sustenance and you just sort of like keep on walking sort of like the wily e. coyote just keep on walking off the ledge and mm-hmm. you'll see that even though there's no ground below you you're gonna like find a direction somehow with full knowledge that you're disagreeing with like the greater academic like perspective and i just found that a little i was literally like well i don't know man i'd be more suspicious of someone telling me that they just wanted to help me than like the person that was telling me I was completely, you know, that that like my way of conceiving of the world was completely wrong and asking me to like have a deeper criticism of like my own perspective. You know, that's just me. Right. But like, you know, in, in the in the like sections when miracles happen, call to character mm-hmm. and uh, carving a space for utopian aspirations. Yeah. She's sort of going into this idea that you will develop a diamond. I don't know. Daemon? The, the daemon that like will guide you in the direction that allows you to have ethical like almost like in this Bedouin sense like to have an engagement with an, an, an event right and have fidelity to that event that guides you in the direction of your ethical cause and that it's a little ambiguous because I feel like what she's arguing for here is kind of like you to persevere towards what you believe is right in the face of like 
people arguing with you, um, which I feel like that's absolutely like a good piece of advice for someone who's struggling with tr- like a truly ethical quandary. But then like once again, I like have this like haunting specter of like the Jordan Peterson crowd where it's just like a bunch of like angry incel loners <laughs> that like if they heard this advice, they would absolutely follow it. Right. Of like persevere in the direction of what you think is like your ethical obligation. Um, let your diamond guide you against like whatever the fuck, you know, and like, you know, the people that are disagreeing with you from the ac- academy rather right, mm-hmm. than the academics. The elites. And, yeah, the elites. And like, don't don't let the vampires, you know, get you because she also invokes vampires. And so it's just a weird line for her to take. And I but find like, myself in agreement yeah. with what she's advocating mm-hmm. for in general. But I also was just like a little like, do we really need to invoke like vampires of ac- <laughs> like of the academy and like daemons guiding you and miracles? Like, I don't yeah. know. It felt it felt like she was very much pulling the whole chapter towards like, and we're in the world of self-help now. Believe in your miracles and believe in it. Don't sure. become a vampire. And but, I was like, what? You but know? I think to some degree, though, like, I think that it's very difficult probably for anyone attempting to do what she's doing to because you're going to have to talk about the individual in some way. Right. Yeah. And so I think that that's what's really challenging. Again, like I think she's successful in greater or lesser degrees, depending on what sh- what specific section of the book. But I think that it's almost like that's the risk that you take. Right. If you're going to talk about the individual and like how you're relating to like singularity or whatever like i think that that's the risk right it's like you're well you're gonna have to somehow tread over the same ground i would say the difference though is like in all my experience of self-help stuff and in the jordan peterson crowd despite like their discussions about like whatever like ethical commitment or like persistence in the face of like your detractors and like you know brushing the haters off or whatever There is no discussion about the negative, disruptive aspect of subjectivity. And again, I think that Mm -hmm. almost in a way, it's like I actually really appreciate her critiques of, you know, the the advocates of like subjective destitution, like let's say Zizek or Edelman or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just think that also it's like important to recognize that for her, like structuring her argument against them, I think in a way, like maybe one of the weaknesses is, is that it maybe does make it easy for like she has to not emphasize the negative in a, in a substantial enough degree that it would be very easy to read it in that way. Mm-hmm. And maybe again, like we're talking about, it's the way, like it's the way that she's framing this that could make it very uh, like easy to be recuperated mm-hmm. by that and, and obscure those elements. But I guess like it's hard for me to read this and not always have in the background like, well, she's responding to people like Zizek and Badiou. And because we've talked about them so much, and we know them. It's like it's easy for me to read this and, and just like have that in the back of my mind. But if you didn't, like, how would you even like really understand what she's responding to? You know? Yeah. And I think, yeah, uh, there's I'm aware of this, that she's arguing. It's almost like she arrives at similar conclusions. Mm-hmm. Right. To the to that to the ethics of like maybe like the Jordan Peterson crowd, but for opposite reasons, right? Like it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. because she's arguing, like you said, for the negativity within the subject and like mm-hmm. sort of self-relating, like singular uh, domain that she's trying to define. And it's absolutely for the opposite reasons that like somebody like Jordan Peterson would argue that you need to like stick to your guns and like, you know, stand for what you believe in, right? Mm-hmm. It's like just because there's a coincidence of like what they advocate for doesn't mean that there's a coincidence of like background against which you advocate for it in the first place. And so I think she's absolutely yeah. invoking like a lot of different perspectives on ethics and she makes it very clear why it is that she ends up arguing for that same thing i just think at the point that i was at in reading and like being big mad about all kinds of stuff hearing her invoke like this strange like (laughs) mythical fantasy land of like you're fighting vampires and your daemon is guiding you and like like what the fuck you know she brings up at the very end of the first chapter she brings she has this quote and i actually didn't write down where it is but she asks this question because she's criticizing zizek's like subjective destitute like ethical act right Mm -hmm. that like sort of pulls the subject out of their like socio-symbolic order and kind of like it's like that sort of antigone idea of like just doing what's right despite what the consequences are going to be for you and your symbolic order Uh, almost like this kantian type of ethics and like she kind of asks this question uh how can a life devoid of shared symbolic ideals values and systems of representation aid us right and that's kind of like her critical question to zizek of like well how can like putting yourself in this subjective destitution actually help us ethically as subjects right and like you know i guess i just found it odd because i was sort of like well but you're encouraging us instead of completely making yourself destitute as a subject by like following your ethical pursuit you're saying to sort of situate 
our suggestion to go in the direction of our like ethical substantive perspective to like situated in like a diamond that has like directed us and that we need to like accept miracles so that we don't become vampires and it just seems strange it's almost like you're you're creating this sort of set of fantasy coordinates that allow you to relate specifically to the same kind of gesture which is like you following your ethical injunction despite its socio symbolic repercussions for you and it just i just found it so odd that like that's how she concluded that chapter of like well how could a life devoid of shared symbolic ideals aid us and then she's kind of advocating for us to still like break ourselves away from the socio symbolic but to just specifically relate to the socio symbolic that supports our perspective as opposed to divorcing ourselves from the socio symbolic space that endorses the opposite of what we believe so that's really interesting to read it that way because my interpretation is very much like her critique of zizek and the subjective destitution is precisely to not to say like that isn't an element of like what she's advocating for in this like miraculous like satinarian kind of perspective it's like Mm -hmm. it's like even whenever we do that and this is actually something that i think is part of her criticism um hold on this is actually one of my notes i had i think that her critique is like you know the position of like subjective destitution isn't maybe as disruptive of the symbolic as we think it is, that maybe there are certain times when it can be. There are also times whenever that position actually allows the symbolic to function even more directly, or, Mm -hmm. and I think this is one of her critiques coming from a feminist lens, like kind of reinforces this like singular individualistic hero, like masculine perspective, which maybe people like Zizek and Badiou take on and don't realize how that's shot through with those assumptions. I mean, I think that this is, it's a tricky sort of line to walk, right? Because I think... I think that why she's critiquing it is to say that it isn't that that like that position of that subjective destitution like couldn't help us. It's the idea that that is the act and then like that's it. But it doesn't sort of have this also character of like, but how are we then still relating to the symbolic and the imaginary? Like, how does it shift our relationship to those things? Like that, I think, is what I read in her. Like, that's what she's pushing for is like, that's why we still need that subjective destitution. It's just that, like, it can't just be that in itself. Like, there also has to be a way that it shifts our relation to the symbolic order. And it also helps us maybe like understand how just because we're like taking that subjective destitutive act, like it doesn't necessarily really challenge in a radical way like the social order as we find it yeah i I, and i agree with that i think i just you know i think there was like a what it felt like to me when i was reading this from from like what my note says Mm -hmm. it's almost as though like i think maybe what she's advocating for overall is like a sort of not baby steps per se but like a certain degree to which we have to build up to that subjective destitution in Mm. the act right that like we can't just go from like being immersed in a life world and being satisfied with what that has to offer us and then just recognize some unethical thing like oh a police officer murdering a person in the street yeah and then like just like abandon our whole life world right that there's some kind of engagement that we have to have with those events and i think that she very much kind of follows a Bedouin line here right of like Once that engagement is carried over successfully, that fidelitous engagement to the event like in Badiou is carried over successfully, there will be a symbolic reticence or like retaining of specifically the name that we give to the Mm. thing that that created the event. And like, yeah, it's like there is no event without the subject that then names the event. Right, exactly. And so she's kind of following that line. And then I think in my head, I was a little bit like, okay, but this feels like what capitalist subjects encounter anytime that they're addressed in their own position of responsibility for like what it is that our society is capable of and what it like sort of perpetrates on a daily basis right what what you experience is the subjects being like all of a sudden morphed into these like soft squishy little beings that just like need nurturing and like need encouragement right Mm -hmm. but like in a sense when they're out perpetrating the things that our society endorses them to perpetrate that are unethical and evil really outright they don't need any nurturing to do those things right the nurturing comes from like a certain kind of broken relationship they have to their Mm -hmm. own desire but like yeah as soon as they're expected to engage with the like ethical responsibility then they're like squishy soft and they need nurturing and i guess i guess like in that sense I was like the people that you're encouraging to like accept the miracle of their like transcendent access to like ethical fidelity to the event are also the people that would probably like be in that position of complaining that they are in need of nurturing and feeling squishy and soft now that they've seen their like responsibility mm-hmm. in the in the like sort of engagement with capital that they that that they 
encounter. And so I guess I'm sort of like, I don't know, do those people, are those the people that need the nurturing? And or are those the people that we should encourage to like accept the miracle and just let the fucking transcendence flow through them? Right. Or is it, you know, people who actually are encountering the perspective of Zizek and going like, oh shit, like I do see how that sort of potential for subjective destitution could run counter to my ethical engagements, right? Like, is it something that I believe I should sacrifice? Um, I feel like this lessens the blow of like what those ethical engagements will inevitably lead to, which is your destitution from all of your socio-symbolic connections and and the implications that that will have for you. I, I, I don't think that that's avoidable. And I'm kind of on the side of Zizek there that like the signifier is never going to hold for you a true in- encounter with like the ethical, right? It always masks what the real holds, I guess, you know? And yeah. So- I guess I would just say it's interesting because like my read of that is that I don't think the act of subjective destitution, like fully uh, like exits you from like socio symbolic relations. Yeah, I can't. Like, like, yeah. But think about Antigone, right? It's like the whole reason she could oppose crayon was because of her love of her brother. Right. Mm-hmm. Or like I think about like what is the thing that usually is the most radical fucking thing about being involved in like leftist like revolutionary politics. Yeah. It's precisely the fact that your socio symbolic socio symbolic relations are to something that is sort of parasitic or like, you know, sort of the stain on like the social symbolic order as it exists. And so mm-hmm. I think to me it's more of a question of like how are you conceptualizing what exactly is your set of relations and like how you're conceptualizing those versus like the idea of like, well, like to me, like whenever you experience subjective destitution from let's say like the order of capitalism to me it's like what you find is actually like a much just like a different set of relations that somehow have been like sort of like uh, pervasive and almost like disruptive that were there the whole time Mm -hmm. that you just never really knew how to recognize because you were interpolated in a particular way yeah 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 and yeah i agree with all of that and i think maybe because i think that like from my perspective and in my readings of zizek i always assumed that like that was the perspective that he was coming at this from is that like sure sure yeah you're a symbol is never like really fully encompassing of your potential so even when you do have that like encounter with that like absolute ethical act yeah it's not even an absolute ethical act and could never be yeah. because it yeah, comes yeah, yeah, to yeah. you through the symbolic yeah so exactly exactly fucking go for it because in a sense <laughs> it's already it. yeah just do just do it fucking we nike just, check we in just the air. re-recuperated nike <laughs> <laughs> you're back nike you're on the good side of cash give us that endorsement money um <laughs> But like yeah, Nike, I, become a patron of Red Library, please. Yeah, please subscribe. <laughs> subscribe to the ten dollars tier. Subscribe, please, hit Nike. the like button. But like, yeah, at the end of the day, you should go hard because uh, you're, what you're going to find is that going hard doesn't even get you the thing yeah, that right. you thought it was going to get you in that yeah, emancipatory yeah. act. So anyway, think that maybe we can draw a conclusion to chapter one, unless you like have more to say. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just looking at chapter two, and I think that we've actually. We probably covered like, a lot we've more actually of it covered we a lot of this, but I do want to hit on a couple of notes. And I think this is related to her again, like sort of focus on Santner and her like perspective as like being sort of a third possibility besides Zizek and Badiou. Mm-hmm. And I think she does talk a lot about like the role of fantasy and destiny. And so I just think I wanted to make sure that we kind of get across here that for Rudy, she also is drawing on someone like, uh, let's say Hans Lowald who basically had like this idea that there are different perspectives on the role of fantasy in psychoanalysis and kind of similar to her whole project. There's this, this idea that like fantasies, yes, like can be compulsions and like a structure or desire and repetitions, but also that fantasies can have this sort of life giving function, which allow us the ability to like reshape our fate and engage with life in this way that actually like adds to it and Mm -hmm. not just like traps us in these like repetition compulsions. Mm -hmm. Sort of like the bending of the signifier or something that's sort of like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, So I think that like her interpretation of fantasy is very similar. So she says the fantasy is fate defining in the sense of determining the content of the repetition compulsion and fidelity to certain existential designs and preferences, even when they cause us harm. So she basically says that, that I guess this is more the standard interpretation interpretation of how fantasy functions she says that they limit what we think is possible and trap us in repetitive patterns of relating and being which are not situation specific and i will say as as a clinician this idea of not situation specific is really key like that's the whole thing that causes us so much pain and suffering we're never like responding to the actual situation Mm -hmm. it's always the thing that we're engaging in the repetition compulsion about that's really what's so fucking disruptive yes but she also says they promise to suture our lack and self-division thereby ending our constitutive trauma, which we talked about, right, and alienation. She says this is really characteristic of the mirror stage and that they fill our own subjective gaps, but also the gaps is the big other, 
of as social fantasies. But she basically says that this other sort of perspective, this like other side that's more life giving, she basically says it's related to, like you said, like the bending of the signifier, that some signifiers are sustaining for life and enabling, but there are others which are denigrating and wounding. And the idea is like there are two different aspects of them or two different types. And yeah, she basically says that. The task for analysis is to understand the distinctive truth of our desire by confronting the nexus of alienation, injury, and signification that gives rise to our what she calls like particular destiny. And that whenever something's symptomatic, it means that we haven't extricated our desire from the desire of the other. I, yeah, I just wanted to like hit on that because I think that it's her starting to set up this sort of different interpretation that she has. And, and related to Satner, she says that the desire of the other expresses an excess in meaning and you cannot locate it in any specific position, so it can seem to exert independence. And so I think that the whole idea here is just that Sentner's kind of approach is basically to say that despite how traumatic and uh, alienating and causing all this sort of like the structure of desire and our relation to the other and the signifier, there is this other aspect of how it functions. It's, you know, it's kind of like the Anstos that we were talking about with, with Fichte, right? It's not yeah. only the obstacle, it's also the thing that gives rise to like possibility and and the thing that allows for us to like function at all is so it's a to me it's always like for Rudy it's a question about which one are we emphasizing yeah and I think for her I see her as like trying to emphasize this other aspect where yes it's the obstacle and it also is the thing that creates like the condition of possibility yeah absolutely and I think she kind of there's there's an example that I was going to bring up she there was a moment where she talks about two examples of like a a defiant sort of like ethical act um you know in this in this sense on both sides right she talks about rosa parks mm -hmm. and she talks about mary latourneau who was like i think a professor who ended up having like a relationship with one of her students oh yeah i remember um, this example yeah and and that basically she ends up talking about how that potential or that possibility for like an emancipatory act because she kind of is criticizing zizek's tendency to say that like uh you know an ethical act or like a this like subjective destitute ethics sort of like also applies to domains which we may not want to consider like mm -hmm. in the domain of the ethical like i think she invokes like he has a statement where he says something about like uh serial killing or like some kind of like mass murder or something can could be kind of seen as like an example of this like subjective destitution in the name of the ethical act or whatever and so i don't know um she kind of argues against that by presenting mary latourneau in a redeeming light kind of like saying that like her act to or like or like her decision to sort of like fall in love or like have the sexual encounter with one of her students is sort of challenging the mores of our sexual or sexual ideas in society of like this is inappropriate the relationship is mm -hmm. inappropriate and she kind of says i don't know she ends up sort of talking about how the way that that gets reintegrated into the symbolic space can be detrimental and she says she kind of says it's like ironic because uh, Mary Latourneau eventually after like counseling and like losing her position and all this stuff I think ends up marrying that that kid that she ended up having that relationship yeah. with mm -hmm. and so Rudy kind of like identifies it as like a, a a sort of compromising on the ethicality of like her defiance of the socio-symbolic right yeah. that she eventually concedes that her love has to be structured by the symbolic order in order for it to be like appropriate which is kind of like runs antithetical to like her entire decision to love that person in the first place yeah and, with, and just to say this that's I think what I was saying earlier about her saying that well just because something is from the place of like subjective destitution doesn't mean that it's like completely divorced from the symbolic or mm -hmm. it can't actually like serve to reinforce the exact things of the symbolic and the other yes exactly and so no i think she also highlights the aspect of like the rosa parks like mm -hmm. not like refusing to get up from her seat on the bus as like a thing that rosa parks probably didn't have any real necessarily like any conception of like how much of a symbolic act that, that would necessarily be it was like absolutely like situated within the immediacy of her subjectivity maybe you know and that she wasn't thinking of it with regard to its repercussions in the greater scheme of like civil rights and all these things but like i don't know that there's a degree to which we can really separate those things in fact i don't even really remember if, if rudy makes a much of a point of that but well it is interesting about the rosa parks example because rosa parks was actually picked and was like you know very involved with the naacp it's part yeah. of the reason why she was the person on the bus who refused like she mm -hmm. was it wasn't just this like pure radical act like mm -hmm. she was very much involved in the civil like an organization around civil rights and also was kind of picked to be that person yeah yeah okay so yeah yeah maybe in a in a sense there was a degree to which that was absolutely like 
intended to be the consequence of like her mm-hmm. her action as opposed to that being some kind of like revolutionary act yeah i well that was something i think is like a history of rosa parks that like typically you know the recuperation of it or the reintegration of the symbolic order is actually to completely divorce her from the social relations and like the organizing that she was a part of it is to yeah. say no she was the individual engaging in this pure active subjective destitution it's like yeah. well that's the thing that actually de-radicalizes it to yeah understand it, her that and, way. and also once again falls prey to like this eternally recurring idea in our society that like the only things that can be conceived of as ethical are when you make a decision that's like singular to you or like yep, you know absolutely. like pers- your perspective only came from like your own internal essence of like what is right or good mm-hmm. yeah. and like that that like completely forecloses the possibility that there could be like organizations that like have specific ways of engaging with society through like planned action that is like mm-hmm. discussed and is intentional and it like just sort of like gives over to the devil the entire domain of like all human action as being like particular to the individual or having to be situated in some kind of authentic individual engagement as opposed yeah. to being open to the possibility of like radical organizing and like intentional struggle. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And so, well, let, let's maybe, um, do you have anything else for chapter two really? Uh, I think we're, I think we've even like maybe invoked stuff all the way up to part two. Of the I, w- book. I would um, say, you yeah. know, I think it's probably, we could probably go ahead and move on to part part two well I, we're at you know. we're at two hours so let me i'm going to tag on my last notes for chapter two and then we'll move on to chapter three and again i think we're I've already anticipated a lot of this but i think that like one of the things that she mentions i think is really key here especially with the way that psychoanalysis is being talked about a lot like right now i think especially as like more people in leftist politics are like re-engaging with psychoanalysis yeah so she basically says that you know it's important to remember that zizek has a critique of lacanians who accept lack as the foundation of subjectivity mm, mm-hmm. right like it's important to recognize like there's a lot of critiques about that as like the starting point but rudy also thinks that lacan only offers lack as the foundation of like subjectivity as an alternative to fantasy fantasies since we're talking about fantasies right yes Mm -hmm. and she basically says that psychoanalysis recognizes the signifier's ability to to modify our quote-unquote tenacious destiny and i will say that about the daemon she has this interesting thing where she says the analyst as daemon replaces the fantasy fixation you know this sort of thing of like the train tracks and you're just always like engaged in repetition compulsion with inquisitiveness and establishes a new fixation which this is the key which is at every point accessible to our intervention and that's straight from freud yeah this is a quote from her she says in this sense, analysis gradually converts the concealed, quote unquote, too muchness of the subject's drive energies, its habitual allegiance to symbolic sites of authority and the big other, into forms of meaning that no longer communicate submission, but rather express something about its singularity of being, and hence create the possibility of new possibilities. So I would say the thing that does, whether it's hard to read her this way or not, I do think the thing that she does offer very different than like a Peterson esque like union yeah. kind of like Damon kind of bullshit. Yeah, is that it's this possibility of always re intervening to create the possibility of new possibilities, which is not what the implication is for someone like Peterson, right? Which right. is always like, well, you should just actually engage in the hierarchy in this like like bullshit pseudo evolutionary biology way. Because that's the thing that's going to make you happy in life. And that's going to, like, give you a place in society. And I think yeah. Rudy's difference is to say, like, no, like, it's exactly in the way that you can intervene in this process and in the way that you're engaging the world consistently and open that up that's, like, the real radical move. Yeah, I like that a lot. And and I think that, yeah, she's absolutely emphasizing that. You know, I think, yeah, she concludes that chapter with, like, that discussion about naming mm-hmm. in Badu versus naming in Zizek yeah. and, like, kind of talks about those things. But, yeah, at the end of the day, it's it's important to, to distinguish the reason for re-engaging with the symbolic and to, to differentiate it from like yeah specifically that jordan peterson yeah. ethics of like don't buck the system bucko yeah. like, <laughs> i don't know what the rules are i don't know what the rules are the the reason that lipstick is red is because your lips are engorged it's like uh you know it's like a thing you know like if your lips are engorged you're aroused i don't know i don't know what the rules are i don't know what the rules are <laughs>